Operation Greenup, an operation carried out by a special group of men many have called the Real Life and Glorious Bastards, a reference to the 2009 Quentin Tarantino film in which a group of U.S. Jewish soldiers plot to assassinate high-up Nazi leaders. Operation Greenup wasn't exactly like the Hollywood blockbuster. No one was catching Nazis and carving swastikas into their foreheads. Hitler doesn't get submachine gunned down in a burning theater that also gets blown up. Gotta love Tarantino's over-the-top death sequences. Uh, There was no assassination plan, but a lot of daring, cinematic, and incredibly courageous moments did go down. There was a cast of characters that, you know, feel more like Hollywood creations than real people sometimes. It was an amazing high-risk, high-stakes operation that did truly involve some Jewish men risking their lives, parachuting in behind enemy lines to, quote, kill some Nazis. They may not have been pulling off executions in the woods, but they did help give the Allies valuable intel that saved a whole bunch of lives. The short version of their story is this. Two Jewish refugees to the United States living in Brooklyn, Frederick Mayer, 23, Hans Winberg, 22, end up in the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, forerunner to the CIA, and parachute deep behind Nazi lines into the Austrian province of Tyrol in February of 1945. Their mission, to compile reports on German rail traffic over the Brenner Pass between Italy and Austria, and make sure the Germans don't have a secret Alpine fortress. Any intel they could glean there would help shape the Allies' plans for a final World War II showdown with Nazi Germany. A third man also parachuted in with them, Franz Weber, a Wehrmacht lieutenant who had belatedly come to his sentences about the tyrannical, anti-Semitic, sociopathic nature of Adolf Hitler and his war. Operation Greenup ended up bringing the Allies important information that shattered some troublesome propaganda. The Germans had concentrated a large number of men and weapons in the South that could have extended World War II's bloodshed by months, leading to possibly tens of thousands of additional deaths. Not only that, but after being captured and tortured by Gestapo agents and refusing to give any intel, Frederick Mayer also negotiated the peaceful surrender of Innsbruck, the Tyrolean provincial capital, to the U.S. 7th Army on May 3, 1945, saving even more lives. He even ended up getting, after withstanding some brutal torture where he gave up zero secrets, some of his captors to surrender to him. Dude was a gutter fighter, which will make sense by the end of this episode. Operation Greenup was one of the OSS's most successful intel missions of World War II. And we're sucking this little known but very important piece of history right here, right now, on another World War, always fun to rehash the Nazis going down, military edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. How are you doing? Able to enjoy the summer? Or for you Southern Hemisphere suckers, uh, getting any skiing in, uh, doing anything fun this winter? I'm Dan Cummins, a master sucker, Whipple, class action lawsuit defense attorney. Maybe it's Giants with David Hatcher, children's executive producer and showrunner. A better parent than Fred or Rose West, and you are listening to Time Suck. Symphony of Insanity stand-up comedy tour almost here. Go to dancummins.tv to get links to tickets to Spokane shows, Cleveland, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Portland, Philadelphia, Kansas City, Denver, San Francisco, Columbus, Tampa, and more. So many stops coming up this fall, starting in August. Uh, Less shows per market this time because, well, I've got Bad Magic Productions to run now. And I love it. So uh, so grab those tickets before they're sold out because we won't be adding shows in every market, no matter what. Uh, no new merch for a change, but if you're hearing this right after it comes out, there is a 4th of July sale. Happy belated 4th, by the way. The same uh, or the sale runs until Tuesday, July 6th, uh, midnight Pacific time. Use code FREEDOM20, FREEDOM20 to check out or at checkout for 20% off site-wide. Space Lizards get 30% off with the Space Lizard code. And that's FREEDOM20. And last quick announcement, Hot sauce! The Bit Elixir team of Chris Pockell and Zach Steele, designers of the Time Suck app and Bad Magicians, they are hot sauce lovers. And now they are hot sauce makers. They have a hot sauce company, Elixir Sauce Co. They're pumped about it. They just made a batch of three sauces, Smoky Ghost Hot Sauce. They grow their own ghost peppers, and they're hot as fuck. I would give a testimonial, but there's no fucking way I'm having ghost pepper hot sauce. But I know a lot of people love that shit, like these guys. The sauce itself is hickory smoked goodness, might blow your dick and or your lady ween off. They also have smoky habanero hot sauce. Same exact recipe as the smoky ghost, but with habaneros instead of ghost pepper. So a little less hot, still could blow off some of your bits. And then they got garlic jalapeno hot sauce, the least hot, still pretty hot though. Uh, It's green, made with shallots, garlic, jalapenos, still spicy, but less chance of you shitting fire later. 
you can, you know, throw it on your eggs fairly risk-free in the morning. So Time Suckers get 10% off at checkout with the discount code TIMESUCK if you go to elixirsauce.com and get some of their uh, first FDA-approved batch before it's gone. I love being surrounded by so many entrepreneurs. And now, now it's show. Now we're diving back into World War II and covert military operations. Operation Greenup sounds like something out of a spy novel. I have no doubt that certain spy novel authors have uh, taken a great deal of inspiration from some of the real shit that went down in this operation in 1945. Feels like a movie, like some kind of thriller. Uh, One of the things that makes it so cinematic is its cast of characters. Recent U.S. immigrants, European Jews, Mayer and Weinberg, Winberg, uh, excuse me, uh, have just escaped almost certain death at the hands of the Nazis years earlier. Now they're hell-bent on destroying the regime that had persecuted them and their families. And there was a third musketeer, Lieutenant Weber, a German soldier on the run from a death sentence for desertion. And there was a support staff of locals who helped these three men once they left Allied support to parachute in behind enemy lines, like Anna Niederkircher, mother of Weber's fiance, who gave the team shelter, support, and protection for the Nazis at the risk of her own life for a time. A woman who once cried out, both in despair and defiance, if Hitler wins the war, then I don't believe in God anymore. Fair. Uh, the men in this operation, everyone who helped them, were risking their lives behind enemy lines to fight the big behind enemy lines, excuse me, to fight the biggest evil that anyone alive had ever encountered in the 1940s in their lifetimes. A megalomaniacal dictator who led a regime that had already executed millions of innocent men, women, and children. A regime that wanted to kill so many millions more to wipe out the Jewish population worldwide, to, to wipe out, you know, a variety of people off the fucking planet, to eradicate anyone who didn't fit Hitler's arbitrary and pretty much nonsensical definition of Aryan. Fred Mayer and Hans Winberg had already escaped Hitler's clutches once they'd made it out, and now they volunteered to go back into Nazi territory to help save others who hadn't escaped. About as noble and as courageous as it gets. Uh, a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah in this one. Hail motherfucking Nimrod, and here we go! Uh, another pretty straightforward narrative today, like last week. No complicated story structure needed. I'm going to go over the OSS, who the OSS, you know, was, uh, since it was the organization that formulated Operation Greenup. Then in the timeline, we'll meet the core Operation Greenup trio and some others, in, uh, you know, integral in- integral to their mission as we, uh, actually, I think it's integral. I, I second I second guess myself uh, too much, and I'm, I, th- I wrote down the first one correctly, I think my notes. Uh, as we march through the, the deeds they did that earned them the title of the real life and glorious bastards. That'll be our swashbuckling show today. So the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, forerunner to the CIA, the organization that planned Operation Greenup and in many ways shaped what the uh, U.S. military and national security system looks like today. We've talked about the OSS in numerous sucks, but it's been a minute. And due to the sensory overload, uber-connected uber information age times we live in where we have a ton of new shit thrown in our brain uh, every day and most of our brains, mine included, just don't have the ability to retain even close to all of it. I think they're worth reviewing. Formed by an FDR presidential military order on June 13th, 1942, as an agency of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the OSS was the forerunner to the CIA and influenced the creation of the U.S. Army Special Forces in the early 1950s and then the Navy SEALs in the early 1960s. The SEALs owe part of their legacy to OSS Maritime Group operatives. To understand the OSS and thus many of the modern government organizations it turned into, we have to understand how things worked before there was the OSS. The most basic form of intelligence gathering, spying, well, that goes back to the very beginning of America's founding. And of course it does. Basically, every nation in the history of nations has used spies to gather intelligence on their enemies when they need it. The ancient Greeks had spies. George Washington had spies during the American Revolutionary War. Uh, The Culper Ring was a network of spies organized by Washington and Major Benjamin Talmadge. These spies, led by Abraham Woodhull and Robert Townsend, operated under the aliases of Samuel Culper Sr. and Jr., And they provided Washington with all kinds of info by infiltrating British Army operations in New York City, where the British were headquartered. Through their intel, Washington learned of surprise attacks and various raids being planned, which obviously helped them defend against these attacks uh, attacks tremendously. They also learned that they had a traitor amongst their ranks, Benedict Arnold, and they gathered a whole bunch of other intelligence. The Culper Ring could be a suck unto itself. An actual intelligence agency was not formed in the U.S. until 1882. And it was pretty rudimentary. The Office of Naval Intelligence. Uh, Three years later, the Army created an information office in 1885 that would evolve into becoming the Military Intelligence Division in 1918. World War I stimulated growth of both units as well as the Cipher Bureau, 
within the State Department on June 17, 1917. The need for coordination grew when President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered the Federal Bureau of Investigation, previously entirely involved in crime solving, to carry out counter-espionage activities in Latin America. Roosevelt also created a propaganda organization with quasi-intelligence functions, the Office of Coordination of Information, in 1941. And that agency soon evolved into a true intelligence organization, the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, with propaganda left to the Office of War Information. Uh, before World War II, the U.S. government traditionally left intelligence to the principal executors of American foreign policy, the Department of State and the Armed Services. Uh, attaches and diplomats collected the bulk of America's foreign intelligence before the OSS, mostly in the course of official business dealings and occasionally in clandestine meetings with secret contacts. I like thinking about how most of the intelligence gathering was conducted through uh, like official business dealings. I know this wasn't what it was, but I just picture some diplomat just asking some government official from a country worried about going to war against us. Just questions about what they're up to, and then just accepting just whatever answers they give at face value. So, um, are you guys uh, are you guys thinking about attacking us? <laughs> no, 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 uh, not no, nah, no, not that I'm aware of. Absolutely not. Okay, okay, good. I was I was worried because I you know I heard you guys were making a lot of bombs, like so many bombs, and that you wanted to drop a lot of those bombs on us. Oh, what? <laughs> no, no, uh, no, definitely not doing that. Oh, okay, well. I mean, but you are making like some bombs though, right? <laughs> what? Bombs? Nope. Zero bombs. I don't, we don't even know what bombs are, to be totally honest. Okay. Well, all right. That feels good. Hey, uh, but just when I was talking to you about that, uh, I just saw two guys wearing your military uniforms walk behind you uh, carrying a bomb. Uh, was, was, was that your bomb? Be honest. Was that your bomb? What? No. That bomb? No, we just found that bomb. Um, we found it laying down in the woods and we're trying to, we're trying to figure out who it belongs to. Oh, phew. Okay. <laughs> I feel better. Thanks for honestly answering my questions and just let me uh, gather some intelligence. Uh, glad to know we don't have to, you know, bulk up our defenses or anything. Worry about an attack. <laughs> now let's eat and talk business. Uh, before the OSS in Washington, D.C., various desk officers scrutinized their intelligence reports coming in from regional bureaus and military intelligence services. Important and timely information went up the chain of command, perhaps even to the president and might be shared across departmental lines, but no one short of the White House tried to collate and assess all the vital information acquired by the U.S. government. State and military developed their own security and counterintelligence procedures. Independently, the Army and Navy created separate offices to decipher and read foreign communications. Uh, senior diplomat Robert Murphy later recollected, uh, I must be, it must be confessed that our intelligence organization in 1940 was primitive and inadequate. It was timid, parochial, and operating strictly in the tradition of the Spanish-American War. But then when a real, real nasty-looking potential European war began to loom ahead in the not-too-distant future in the 1930s, fears of a fascist and communist presence in America prompted U.S. President FDR to look for ways that intelligence departments could work together. He wanted to advance U.S. intelligence capabilities dramatically and almost immediately. So on July 11, 1941, FDR appointed a World War I war hero, lawyer, and diplomat who had recently worked overseas in an intelligence gathering capacity, William J. Donovan of New York, to sort the mess as the Coordinator of Information, COI, the head of a new civilian intelligence office that was attached to the White House. The Office of the Coordinator of Information constituted the nation's first peacetime non-departmental intelligence organization, like standalone organization. Uh, President Roosevelt authorized it to collect and analyze all information and data that had any relevancy to national security. And this Donovan guy who ran it, uh, awesome, huge, huge hero boner alert. Uh, William Wild Bill Donovan, as he was sometimes known, was a fucking badass. In his mid-30s, he led the 1st Battalion, 165th Infantry of the 42nd Division, into battle during World War I in France, suffered a shrapnel wound in one leg, almost blinded by poison gas. Uh, after performing a rescue under fire, he was offered the Cross of War by the French government, huge military honor, but turned it down because a Jewish soldier who had taken part in the same rescue mission had not also been awarded the same honor. And when that insult was corrected, then he was like, okay, now I'll accept your onerous distinction. Uh, he was also awarded numerous U.S. war medals for bravery and valor and all that stuff. And he got the nickname Wild Bill for a few instances, a few, when he went kind of nuts in France and he killed some civilians. He did kill a couple families, Pretty gory allegations involving decapitations, babies on bayonets, you know, that kind of rough stuff. And I know it's bad, but I, I'm not going to judge him for that because it happened during a really tough war. He was under a lot of stress. And I just think overall, if you help win a war and you get some medals and you save thousands of innocent lives, but you need to blow off steam from time to time by killing a few families, like two or three tops, 
in my book, you're still a pretty good dude. Um, JK, <laughs> gosh dang. Uh, that's not how I got that nickname. No, he got that nickname. <laughs> Can you imagine if I just fucking moved, if I never said JK for that? You know, listen, greater good wise. Yeah, he fucking, yes, he killed a few families. But look, look what he did. Overall, God, fucking judgy. Um, no, he got the nickname for being fearless in battle and for having more endurance and being stronger and more aggressive in battle than uh, a lot of the younger men he led. He claimed not to like his nickname, but I love this, this little detail. His wife said, deep down, he loved it. Uh, Wild Bill Donovan was an energetic civilian who shaped FDR's desire to do whatever it took to resist Nazism and the danger it posed to America. He recruited men he called PhDs who could win a bar fight. Love it. Uh, recruited them into a new intelligence office, also calling them glorious amateurs who learned as they went. They were in uncharted waters, these guys. The uh, COI wrote U.S. intelligence historian Thomas F. Troy. It was a novel attempt in American history to organize research, intelligence, propaganda, subversion, and commando operations as a unified and essential feature of modern warfare, a fourth arm of the military services. The office grew quickly in the autumn before Pearl Harbor with Donovan cheerfully accumulating various offices and staff members. And then with the American entry into World War II, it would be their time to shine. America's entry into the war in December of 1941 provoked new thinking about the place and role of the COI. Donovan and his new office, now with a $10 million annual budget and 600 staffers, were the objects of hostility from the FBI, G2, other old school war agencies who thought they were handling shit just fine without them. New kid comes along, try something different, ruffle some feathers. A story as old as humanity. The newly formed Joint Chiefs of Staff initially shared this distrust. Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they would officially form in 1947 if you're like, wait a minute, why are they around? Uh, but they had been informally created in 1942 as an Oval Office advisory body for you uh, for you World War II history nerds. Uh, they, they regarded Donovan, a veteran, but a, a civilian as an interloper. And they came around to thinking they would like to work with him if his COI could be placed under their JSC control. Isn't that often the case? Oh, we'll, we'll work with him if he has to do what we tell him. And then FDR endorsed the idea of moving COI to the Joint Chiefs, and the COI became the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, on June 13th, 1942, with Donovan still running the show. The OSS then expanded in 1942 into full-fledged operations abroad, with Donovan sending in intelligence units to every theater of the war that would have them like Operation Greenup. Uh, major departments of OSS under Wild Bill included RNA, research and analysis for intelligence gathering. R&D and analysis, of course. R&D, research and development for weapons and equipment development. D&D, uh, &D, Dungeons and Dragons for blowing off steam and having fun in the break room. Uh, JK, of course. MO, morale operations or subversive disguise, quote unquote, black propaganda. MU, maritime units for transporting agents and supplies to resistance groups and to conduct and to conduct naval sabotage and reconnaissance. X2 for counter espionage. SI, secret intelligence to put agents in the field to gather intelligence covertly. SO, special operations for sabotage, subversion, fifth column movements, and guerrilla warfare. Uh, BBB, JWF, bareback blowjob with facial for, you know, blowing off steam and having fun in the break room. Gosh dang, <laughs> that's not true. Uh, kudos to you, Urban Dictionary, for answering some filthy acronym questions I had. Uh, finally, there was uh, another real group, OG. Does not stand for original gangsters. But that feels right for this group. It stands for operational groups. They specialize in sabotage and guerrilla warfare. OG units were composed of highly trained foreign language speaking commando teams. Operation Greenup would fit in the OG category. Getting in some action movie territory here. Feels like uh, this could all be backstory for some kind of Expendables movie. Uh, Donovan's OSS sent a dozen officers to work as vice consuls in several North African ports where they established networks and acquired information to guide Allied landings called Operation Torch in November of 1942. At its peak in late 1944, OSS employed almost 13,000 men and women. General Donovan employed thousands of officers and enlisted men seconded from the armed services, and he also found military slots for many people who came to the OSS as civilians. U.S. military personnel comprised over two-thirds of the OSS's strength, with civilians from all walks of life making up the remaining third. About 7,500 OSS employees served overseas. About 4,500 were women, some 900 of them serving in overseas postings. Hail Lucifina! A lot of different meat sacks in the OSS. 1945, the office spent $43 million, bringing its total spending over its four-year life to around $135 million. These 13,000 employees even included some, some famous actors and public figures like John Ford, Marlena Dietrich, and Julia Child. And with the new big investment in spying came new, better spy gear. OSS activities created a steady demand for devices and documents that could be used to trick, attack, or demoralize an enemy. 
General Donovan, Wild Bill, yeah, 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 uh, enthusiastically promoted an in-house capability to fabricate the tools that the OSS would need for its clandestine missions. By the end of the war, OSS engineers and technicians had formed a collection of labs, workshops, and experts that occasionally gave OSS a technological edge over their Axis foes. The products range from silenced pistols to limpet mines to something called Aunt Jemima, an allegedly explosive powder packaged in Chinese flower bags. Tiny cameras and inconspicuous letter drops were devised to assist OSS agents in enemy territory. Uh, disguises improved as well. The latest German and Japanese issued ration cards, work passes, identification cards, even occupation currency all had to be secretly acquired, perfectly imitated, securely passed to operatives preparing for missions that could end in sudden death if any part of their cover story went awry. An agent's appearance had to be just as carefully prepared. In the words of the OSS official history, each agent had to be equipped with clothing sewn exactly as it would have been sewn if it were made in the local area for which uh, he was destined. His eyeglasses, dental work, toothbrush, razor, briefcase, traveling bag, shoes, and every item of wearing apparel had to be microscopically accurate. Damn. How far would you be willing to go to disguise yourself for some clandestine mission? Like, what if you have great teeth? And then they're like, sorry, but your teeth are too clean. They're too straight to blend in. So we're going to have to pull a couple of your beautiful teeth, knock some pieces off a few of the other teeth, and really dirty the rest up. Also, going to need to graft more hair onto your face and back and legs and, well, everywhere. Also going to need to uh, connect your eyebrows and take out one of your eyeballs and remove a few fingers and sharpen your remaining fingers into claws and then pin a tail at the base of your spine and make your hair on your head really splotchy and mangy. I know it's extreme. But if you wander into Poland looking too human, they'll know you're not local. Come on. Oh, my heck, that was fun. I left Poland alone forever. Gosh dang. Uh, you know I love the Poles. Uh, and they don't even look like that. A lot of my wife's family have all their fingers, most of their teeth, and separate eyebrows. Only a couple have animal claws for hands. Uh, the growing number of OSS coastal infiltration and sabotage projects eventually gave rise to an independent branch, the Maritime Unit. Right, kind of a, kind of a precursor to the Navy SEALs to develop specialized boats, equipment, and explosives. The unit fashioned underwater breathing gear, waterproof watches and compasses, an inflatable motorized surfboard, that sounds fun, and a stealthy two-man kayak that proved so promising that 275 were ordered by the British. Some of the spy tools, uh, not great, you know, you, you throw a lot of shit at the wall, some of it sticks, some of it doesn't, some of them pretty funny. Project Campbell, for instance, a remote-controlled speedboat disguised as a local fishing craft guided by aircraft that would detonate against an anchored Japanese ship. The prototype sank a derelict freighter in trials, but the U.S. Navy had no way of getting close enough to a Japanese harbor in real life to launch Campbell and declined to develop the weapon. This is a funny spy weapon for me to think about. I'm sure in my mind, I'm picturing something that's not at all like what they developed. <laughs> I'm picturing them developing like a really cool RC speedboat, but not like a regular sized boat, like a, like a kid's <laughs> RC, RC boat. Just a couple feet long, and, but super explosive, right? It's, it's awesome. It's so awesome. But one drawback, you have to be within 500 feet of it to control it. And for some reason, uh, a pilot ends up controlling it because they were talking about, you know, like aircraft, like with P Project Campbell. So the aircraft has to be really, <laughs> really close. So to pull off this stealth mission, you have to fly practically directly above the thing you're trying to blow up. Any stealth the RC boat provides is completely fucking destroyed by the loud plane flying so close. And since you can't hover in a plane, the plane has to like circle and they can only control the boat for like 10% of the time during the circling maneuver. <laughs> Stay with me. And then it loses control while it circles all the way around again. All right, the most convoluted, worthless spy weapon ever is what I was picturing. Just, all right, Jimmy, let's set this harbor on fire. You got it, Ace. I have contact. The boat is engaged, headed towards the target. And, ah, fuck, just lost it. Gonna need you to circle around. Oh, come on, Jimmy. We're sitting ducks exposed like this. You gotta get that boat bomb on the dock, son. You got it, Ace. Hold on. Keep circling. Okay, I've regained contact, and the boat is... Son of a bitch! Lost contact again. Gonna need you to keep circling around again. Come on, Jimmy. Why can't we just drop some bombs on this harbor? They're firing at us. I don't know, Ace. I don't give the orders. Okay, keep circling. Keep circling. Almost got it. <laughs> yes! We have... Con Motherfucker! We lost contact again. We're taking damage. I think a SEAL just grabbed our bomb boat. Uh, most of the weapon concepts OSS worked on were a lot better than what I just described. Uh, R&D Chief Stanley Lovell felt that no idea could be overlooked. They really did take some weird chances. He said, it was my policy to consider any method, whatever, that might aid the war, however unorthodox or untried. 
Uh, the OSS would have a lot of success in World War II. Operation Greenup would be one of their successes. Uh, then following the war, the agency would transform into the CIA. The OSS trained many of the leaders and personnel who formed the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Their ranks included four future directors, Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, William Colby, and William Casey. Oh, wow, Bill would not lead the CIA. Why not? Fucking politics. Truly. Uh, you know, the new president, uh, President Truman, just didn't like him. Uh, the OSS was shut down after the war, and when the CIA was formed a short time later, Donovan was out. Truman even mocked Donovan in his diary, perhaps fearing that Donovan's proposed intelligence establishment, uh, or proposing that his intelligence establishment might one day be used against Americans. Uh, the mood in Congress, uh, moreover, right after the OSS was shut down, was running against war agencies like OSS. Once the victory was won, the nation and Congress wanted demobilization fast. Donovan, before he stepped down, gave one hell of a farewell speech. He said, talking to many OSS members on September 28th, 1945, in a converted skating rink down the hill from his headquarters at tw uh, 2430 E Street in D.C., we have come to the end of an unusual experiment. This experiment was to determine whether a group of Americans constituting a cross-section of racial origins, of abilities, temperaments, and talents could meet and risk an encounter with the long-established and well-trained enemy organizations. You can, go with the you can go with the assurance that you have made a beginning in showing the people of America that only by decisions of national policy based upon accurate information can we have the chance of a peace that will endure. And then the OSS expired October 1st, 1945. Uh, its successor, the short-lived CIG, Central Intelligence Group, was formed and then replaced less than two years later by the CIA, of course, with the National Security Act of 1947. And the CIA, obviously, still very much around. Now that we have a little bit of uh, history... Under our belts, about the CIA's precursor, the OSS, let's go back and meet two of its finest members, Fred Mayer, Hans Winberg, the real life and glorious bastards, as well as several, several other Operation Greenup players in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. October 28th, 1921. Fred Mayer is born in Freiburg in the former state of Baden, Germany, to uh, Jewish parents. An old city, 9,000 people back in 1395 in Freiburg, uh, about 20, 250,000 now, around 90,000 when Mayer was born. Pretty place, a lot of wineries in the area, down in the southwest corner of Germany, builds itself as Germany's warmest and sunniest city. Uh, also, how cool is this? Home of Herbert Niebling, master lace knitting designer. You may not know his name, but let me tell you. Uh, his designs remain very popular today with the lace knitting enthusiasts. Oh my heck, they fucking do. I was just talking about Herbert with some fellow lace knitters the other day. I was like, Gertrude, Archibald, does this lace knit design remind you of Herbert Niebling? And Archibald was like, fuck yeah, bro. That's a sick ass lace knitting. Holy hell. And then Gertrude, uh, she just looked up for the briefest moment, just kind of barely mumbled as is her way. And then went back to her lace knitting. That's <laughs> classic Gertrude. Uh, Freiburg really is the home of Herbert Niebling. Uh, and he actually is a lace knitting designer. And then I don't know what that is other than I saw it on Wikipedia. But that has nothing to do with today's tale. Fred Mayer, born there in 1921. Now we're back on track. His father, Heinrich Mayer, served in the Imperial German Army during World War I, was decorated with the Iron Cross, second class for gallantry during the Battle of Verdun. And by the way, if you're a new listener, uh, no, these episodes are not built on Wikipedia. Because every once in a while we get that. They are absolutely not. Uh, we'll use that for peripheral, meaningless details only. Like, you know, Herbert Niebling. Uh, Fred's military training started early. His father uh, regularly told him about the horrors of the Battle of Verdun, where hundreds of thousands of soldiers died. His father became a businessman after the war, trying to make a living in the chaotic post-war inflated economy of the Weimar Republic. Uh, just talked about that crazy economy in the Karl Denke suck. And we'll be returning to Germany soon to suck another interwar serial killer there. The vampire of Dusseldorf, uh, Peter Curtin. Teenage Fred, he was a great athlete. He was a member of the skiing and athletic clubs in his hometown. And as a teenager, sought out an apprenticeship with the Ford Motor Company. Ford had a manufacturing presence in Germany uh, all the way back in 1925. Did not know that until this week. Fred was a charismatic young man with a lot of self-confidence, which helped him when he didn't quite know what he was doing with auto parts. It would help him in the war as well. Everything seemed to be going well for young Fred, but in the background of his childhood, the Nazis are rising to power. By 1933, when Mayer is just 12, Hitler and the Nazis have taken firm control over Germany's future. That same year, the first concentration camp is opened for political prisoners. It'll still be many years until Jewish citizens were rounded up in mass and sent to death camps, but the machinery to do that has begun to be built. Despite Fred's dad's heroic service to Germany during World War I, Mayer's family is immediately targeted by the new government, whose official policy is anti-Semitism. 
Fred would later recall walking home and just hearing people casually call him a Jew bastard. So that's not fun. Uh, Mayer's father hoped his distinguished military record would protect his family, but his wife insisted the family leave while they could, saying very bluntly, and boy, was she right, uh, we are Jews and we are leaving. Good, good call, right? They just don't care what you did. Uh, and they would leave just in time. After a two-year struggle with bureaucrats on both sides of the Atlantic, the mayors finally obtained their visas and they immigrated to the U.S. in 1938, just a year before World War II broke out in Europe with just the clothes on their backs. Also in 1938, November 9th and 10th, 7,500 Jewish shops will be destroyed, 400 synagogues will be burnt in what's called the Night of Broken Glass. And that was a big cultural turning point in Germany where mass violence towards Jews and mass destruction of Jewish property became widely socially acceptable. Crazy. I've studied these moments so many times and still they're hard to process. Also, how crazy to uproot your life in that way. We've spoken about this type of situation before. But I think about how shocking and jarring it would be to be you're well into your life. You're doing well career-wise. You're a fucking veteran. You're a war hero. You've raised a law-abiding family and then a new disturbing political party grows in, or comes into power and they hate you. They just hate who, who you were, you know, who you happen to be born. Uh, what like, you know, what race or what, uh, you know, cultural... Uh, persuasion. And then one day your government is just like, uh, you know, they just agree to open season on you and your family. Just fuck them. Get out. Don't care that you fought bravely for our nation just a few years back. Leave your shit and go. Through no fault of your own, you have to start all over again in some place you've never been before. Like what a blessing. And also simultaneously, what a terrible thing to be a war refugee, right? You're so happy you got out, I have to imagine, but so sad you have to rebuild your life from scratch in a place so far from home. You know what? We're oftentimes you don't have any family even. How painful for Mayor's dad, Heinrich, to accept that the country he fought for, risked his life for, just didn't want him anymore. Just despised him, you know, just wanted him dead now. The entire Mayor family, they find a new job soon. Jack of all trades, Frederick Mayor would, by his own count, end up working over 20 different jobs during his time in New York City. Once he switched jobs, one of his bosses made an anti-Semitic remark, and Mayor responded by cold cocking him, knocked him on his ass, and then resigned on the spot. Love that shit. Hail Nimrod and praise Bo Jangles. How fun would it be to punch your boss in the face? I'm sure Joe and Zach and Logan, everyone here would like to smack me in the face from time to time. Lindsay, for sure. Uh, <laughs> of course he would. I get it. Sometimes you just want to punch your boss. I felt that way. I've had several bosses I've wanted to punch. I never did. Mayor did. What a great feeling that must have been to land a solid blow, actually knock him to the ground, not get in any legal trouble and then feel morally justified, right? And then just walk out with the, fuck this place, I quit. You know, just have one of those moments. That's a dream come true. I'd never shut up about it if I did that. Oh man, rest of my life, I've never shut up. Hey, remember that time I, yes, the time you knocked your boss on his ass for saying something he shouldn't? Of course, dear. Everyone remembers because you've been bringing it up several times a day, every day for the last 17 years. Now backing up a bit to November 28th, 1922. Got to meet uh, another Operation Green Up team member. Hans Winberg, born on November 28th, 1922, in a little town where nothing interesting has ever happened, and no one ever talks about this place in the Netherlands. Amsterdam. Does not ring a bell. Definitely have never done any drugs there a few times. For sure, I know that. Anyway, Hans is born there, raised in the Venice of the North, as the canal city is sometimes called. In 1939, seeing the Nazi nightmare riding on the wall, thousands of Jewish citizens are sent to concentration camps that year as political prisoners, quote-unquote, and the Nazis have taken Poland now. Well, Hans's father, uh, Hans's father Leonard, excuse me, sends Winberg and his twin brother Louis to the U.S. The boys stay with their father's business partner there, a diamond cutter. The rest of the family are tragically trapped in Amsterdam. Uh, Nazi Germany will invade the Netherlands the following year in 1940. Hans enrolls in Brooklyn Technical High School, excels in his studies, particularly chemistry. When money gets low, he obtains a job as a research assistant at the pharmaceutical giant Pfizer where he actually assists the doctor who was one of the primary scientists involved with discovering penicillin. Hans was actually present during some purification tests for that drug. Uh, the first use of penicillin in the U.S. wouldn't occur until 1942, despite the drug being discovered in 1928. During the sweltering month of August 1943, Winberg joins U.S. Army reports to boot camp. At about the same time, his father, mother, younger brother, and sister, who stayed in the Netherlands, were captured by the SS and sent to Auschwitz, the concentration camp. Hans didn't know it at the time. He just knew his family stopped replying to his letters. Ugh. Winberg's life changed at boot camp. He was sent on a new path that would lead to Operation Greenup, where an officer approached him and said, we understand you speak German, Dutch, and English. Would you like to help your country? Winberg replied, sure. And then two days later, he was on a train to Washington, D.C. Uh, reconnecting with Mayer now. In December 1941, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Mayer enlisted in the U.S. Army. Hitler's declaration of war on the U.S. came on the morning of December 8th. Within days, Fred Mayer tries to enlist at his local recruiting center in Brooklyn. 
Mayer felt that, quote, the U.S. had provided his family a haven. I felt I needed to give something back. But the morning Mayer first reported to the draft board, he was dismissed. He was turned away for being an enemy alien of German heritage. Uh, U.S. government, a little leery of recent German immigrants, as you might expect. Discouraged but not willing to give up, Mayer's opportunity to serve as adopted country came unexpectedly again, or his second opportunity, or excuse me, his opportunity, second time in front of the draft board. Uh, weeks later, his brother is summoned before the draft board. His brother was a college student at the time, and Mayer wanted him to finish school. So he went before the draft board in his brother's place and volunteers again, seeing his determination. Now the board agrees. The 20-year-old Jewish mechanic was then shipped to Fort Rucker, Alabama, where he received several months of basic training. Graduating boot camp, Private Mayer then received orders to report to the 81st Division in Tennessee, the Wildcats. After Tennessee, Fred's division shipped to Camp Horn in Gila Bend, Arizona, for desert training. And it would be in Arizona where he would distinguish himself above the rest of his recruits and change the course of his life dramatically. October 7th, 1942. Going to bounce over to Europe for just one sec. Hitler speaks to the German people as well as the German armed forces proclaiming, all terror and sabotage troops of the British and their accomplices who do not act like soldiers but like bandits are to be treated as such by the German troops. They must be slaughtered ruthlessly in combat wherever they turn up. From now on, all enemies on so-called commando missions in Europe or Africa challenged by German troops, even if they are to all appearances soldiers in uniform or demolition troops, whether armed or unarmed, in battle or in flight, are to be slaughtered to the last man. Okay. That's, uh, you know, pretty clear fucking message there. The speech laid the groundwork for Addenda A and B of Directive 46, more, more widely known as the infamous Commando Order, which provided for the immediate execution of all captured enemy commandos and spies, whether they were caught in uniform or not. And how does that relate to our story? Well, this would now be the environment into which Operation Greenup would be heading. Certain death if they're caught and their true identities are uncovered. July 1943, during a training exercise in Arizona, back with Mayer now, he crossed the quote-unquote enemy line and captured several officers, including a brigadier general. And then the general said, you can't do that. You're breaking the rules. And Mayer replied, war is not fair. The rules of war are to win. And the general just kind of nodded his head, like, okay, yeah, fair. And then raised his hands in the air, admitting defeat. And before I go further, due to the last name of Mayer, uh, I keep thinking about John Mayer. Just me? Anyone else? Probably just me. Obviously, they have different first names, uh, but ever since I started referring to, uh, to Mayer by just his last name, I've started to think of John Mayer, and I've been wanting to toss John Mayer lyrics into his backstory, <laughs> right? Like the, like the general says, you can't do that. You're breaking the rules. And then Mayer says, war isn't fair, sir, especially when, you know, it's heartbreak warfare. Red, white, and ambient, you're talking shit again. It's heartbreak, heartbreak. Unnecessary. Okay, I'll move on. It's very hard, especially when you're a shitty singer, to sing with no music behind you. Uh, Brigadier General Marcus Bell, assistant division commander of the 81st, is impressed by the young Jewish corporal from Brooklyn, likes his moxie. Next day, he summons Mayer after uh, capturing that, uh, you know, general in the training exercise to his command tent located at Camp Horn, Arizona. For the past four months, Mayer had been assigned to a special reconnaissance unit within the 81st division. As a wildcat ranger, he'd learned advanced infantry skills such as infiltration, demolition, raiding, sniping, hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques. He excelled the training and became the unit's lead scout, a position reserved for only the most daring of men. In this meeting, Bell tells Mayer that he's wasting his time here with the Rangers and asks him if he wants another challenge and to do something, quote, more interesting. And Mayer was like, fuck yeah, bro. No, he was like, uh, yeah, I want to take that challenge. I want to take on Hitler. I'll tell you what I don't want to do. What I don't want to do is just keep on waiting, waiting on the world to change. We keep on waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. One day our generation is going to rule the population. Sorry, that was more horrifically uh, sung John Mayer lyrics. Mayer actually responds with, get me out of the infantry. He wants a bigger challenge. Within a few weeks, a letter arrives requesting that Frederick Mayer report to the headquarters of the Office of Strategic Services in Washington, D.C. The OSS, it's all connected now. He hops on a train and after several days of travel arrives in D.C. Orders in hand, Mayer reports to Captain Howard Chapel, commanding officer of the German Operational Group. A former parachute instructor at Fort Benning, Georgia, Chapel is like an American G.I. Joe figure come to life. Six foot two, tan, blonde, loaded with muscles. His muscles had muscles. After brief instructions, or I'm sorry, introductions, Chapel rounded up Mayer and all the other new OGs, as they were called. A more eclectic group of desperados could not be found. Former Luftwaffe, 
pilots, aka, AKA former German Air Force pilots, a Jewish escapees from German death camps, Polish deserters, some world-class athletes, even a former convict. Six years later, one recruit would muse, the whole bunch were the craziest people I've ever met in my entire life. Fred felt right at home. Uh, Chapel informed that they'd all been gathered there for one very important reason. To see who could hold five popsicles, no more, no less, in their butthole one time. And not done. To not let them fall out and touch the ground until they were melted down to the sticks. They weren't allowed to use their hands to hold them in either. This was going to be a man's game. Who could melt them the fastest? It was the race to end all races. It wasn't going to be easy. It would require a lot of concentration, pain tolerance, the confidence to overcome a lot of cultural shame, the courage to smash through taboos, much like those popsicles that smashed through sphincters, enough faith in the military to never ask why such a thing must ever be done, the vision to understand this was breaking new ground that could help defeat the Nazis, and the patriotism to stick five popsicles in your ass and melt them. If that's what Uncle Sam thought was the best course of action to make sure the Star Spangled Banner would yet wave in the land of the free and the home of the brave, let's play ball! Sorry. Got a bit, got a bit dizzy there at the end. I didn't breathe right. What are they saying? Uh, oh, yeah. Captain Chapel informed them. <laughs> I wish that my neighbors could. I don't think there's many people in the building right now. But that's one where I wish they could he- hear it clearly. I don't, think that, I don't think anyone would come knock on the door and ask us to quiet down if they heard that. They'd be like, well, he's clearly very insane. And we should, uh, you know, just uh, take a steer clear of him. Take, take a wide berth around him. Um, I was saying that Captain Chapel informed them that they were all gathered there for a reason. To penetrate enemy lines and strike at the heart of Nazi Germany. Yes. That, that's the correct thing I was supposed to say earlier. The basic unit of organization consisted, consisted of four officers and 30 enlisted men, uh, further segmented into two sections of 16 men. Each section required a variety of operatives with different functional skills, radio operators, medics, demolitionists, weapons specialists, a team leader, uh, all, you know, obviously various team leaders for each team. Uh, all OG operatives, regardless of specialty, uh, had to have two things in common, aggressiveness of spirit and willingness to close with the enemy. Chappelle whipped his men into shape. Mayer was trained in demolition, infiltration, raiding, sniping, more hand-to-hand combat. Uh, Mayer reco- recalled that he was pretty good at the hand-to-hand combat, especially the jiu-jitsu. The men learned their fighting craft from a 50-something gray-haired combat instructor from Shanghai, British Major William Fair- uh, Fairbairn, who developed one of the deadliest systems of street fighting known to man at that time called gutter fighting. Not making it up. Such a great name. Would love to see some MMA fighter introduced as being a gutter fighter. Fairbairn's gutter fighting style evolved from hundreds of street fights he was involved in as the assistant municipal police chief in one of the most dangerous cities on earth at that time, Shanghai, China. Fairbairn summed it up like this. There is no fair play, no fair rules, except to kill or be killed. He added, get tough, get down in the gutter, win at all costs. I teach what is called gutter fighting. (laughs) Dude sounds like someone uh, more from like an old Clint Eastwood action movie than he does a, a real person. Some dude who throws out, you know, great cheesy tough guy lines before beating your ass or killing you. Kind of like uh, Alexander Solonik did in the Super Killer Times like episode. Yeah, you're tough. But tough doesn't mean nothing if you're fighting a man who's gutter tough. Hey, buddy, you drop something down there in the gutter. Your ability to defend your life. Sorry, did you just beg for mercy? Did you just say this isn't fair? Life's not fair, kid. Life is a gutter fight. Uh, the major emphasized knife and close combat fighting saying, uh, real quote again this time, <laughs> gutter fighting is for fools. You should always have a pistol or a knife. However, if you are caught unarmed, the tactics shown here will greatly increase your chances of coming out alive. Fairburn's gutter fighting tactics involve shit like uh, a karate chop called the axe hand. A single blow to the Adam's apple with the bony edge of a hand can kill a man, he said. Nice. Mayer and the other OGs also learned knife fighting, the art of weapon improvisation, such as how to roll a simple newspaper into a stiletto that could pierce the soft tissue underneath an enemy sentry's chin. That's terrifying. Fairbairn shaped the hand-to-hand combat fighting style for Allied soldiers in World War II more than any other single person. Within Mayer's 30-man group, a clique formed among the five Jewish refugees, including Mayer, who had all escaped the clutches of Nazi Germany. There were George Gerbner from Hungary, Alfred Rosenthal from Germany, Bernd Steinitz, or Stenitz from Germany and Hans Winberg from the Netherlands. And I know, uh, and it's by the way, it's not Weinberg. Just if you're curious, I know it's more common. It's uh, it's W I J N Winberg, I believe. Uh, we know Hans. Uh, they all spoke German. They all wanted vengeance for their families suffering at the hands of the Nazis. They all shared a sense of duty to serve their adopted country. It would be Hans Winberg uh, who Fred Mayer would work with most closely in their training. It was discovered that Hans was a natural-born radio operator. He had a mathematical mind and an ear for music. 
which uh, for him made the dashes and dots of Morse code sing. He'd become Fred Mayer's radio operator, his only tether to the outside world once he was behind enemy lines. After learning hand-to-hand combat, demolitions, other infiltration tactics, the men were sent to Fort Belvoir, where they learned to drive tanks and other military vehicles. Although some of the recruits looked like drunken fools driving the tanks and accidentally drove one of the vehicles into a ditch, Mayer was a natural. He later described his tank driving skills, saying, I was a damn good tank driver. And I gotta say, sometimes I hate that level of confidence. You can come across as, you know, so cocky, just kind of arrogant. You know, guys talking about being good at everything. It doesn't bother me with Mayer. It doesn't bother me in this context. This dude hated those fucking Nazis, wanted revenge so badly, he put everything he had into learning how to best take them down. He was really good at it. You know what he was trained to do. And he was proud of how good he was. I like it. Mayer and his unit then moved to Fort Benning to undertake an airborne training program, aka learn how to parachute. The men underwent rigorous U.S. Army parachute, quali- or went through a rigorous U.S. Army parachute qualification program, during which they learned how to pack their own chutes. Training was brutal, intentionally brutal. It was meant to weed out the less dedicated recruits. To maintain their cover as normal soldiers, the OSS issued them with regular M42 paratrooper jumpsuits. Discipline was strict at Fort Benning, included several daily rituals, as Hans Winberg would recall later. He said, we had to wash our uniforms every night and put them on in the morning. Boots had to be polished, including the soles. We also had to refold our own chutes after we jumped. The 16 risers, the ropes, uh, were of course usually entangled because as you hit the ground and were tugged along by the partly inflated chute for a few yards before being able to gather the chute together. This exercise, refolding the chute, has given me a lifelong expertise in untying knots. Punishments were frequent, even for the smallest of infractions. One of the instructors actually punished Winberg for merely looking up into the air. And he would explain why. He said, punishment was frequent, but fairly mild. 20 push-ups for minor infractions. Since other teams were, of course, also training at Fort Benning, planes were overhead all the time and paratroopers were jumping out on neighboring fields. There was a strict rule that we were not allowed to look at the men who were jumping. This was done in order to prevent us from counting. Every jump consisted of a stick, meaning 12 men who would jump. And if we did watch and count, it might occur that we counted 11 men instead of 12, thereby realizing that one parachute had not opened. So watching the jumps was a no-no. I was caught one time watching the jumpers and my punishment was running around our training field while having my arms out and rotating my arms while shouting, I am a bad soldier. I am a bad soldier. I am a bad soldier. I watched the planes. Uh, All this doing double time. Holy shit, did everyone catch what's really what's really going on here? Like what he's really saying here? Dude got in trouble for looking up at other parachutists and the reason that was a no-no was because apparently back then a fair amount of these guys fucking died uh, when they jumped out of those planes. Like their chutes didn't open. I couldn't find any stats directly relating to U.S. domestic parachutist training deaths in the early 1940s, but there were clearly so many of them that the military uh, <laughs> decided to forbid other soldiers from watching. So they didn't think too much about how there was a decent chance that they were going to die doing that. Imagine something similar to that in a civilian job setting, Setting, right? Just, hey, don't look at that meat grinder when someone else is using the meat grinder if you want to keep your damn job. What? What? Why? Well, because it rips off a lot of people's fucking arms. That's why. And if you keep seeing that happen, you're going to be a little jumpy when you have to use it, which makes sense because there's a decent chance it's going to rip your arm off. And the more you think about it, you know, the greater the chance you're probably going to fuck up and lose an arm. Or, or you're going to quit because you're going to get scared. And then I got to find some other asshole to bring in here whose arm is also probably going to get ripped off. And I don't feel like dealing with that shit right now. Uh, jumping out of the planes was a dangerous task. And they had to do it again and again. Equipment failure was an ominous threat. And incorrect parachuting rigging meant death. Uh, uh, during one of the parachute jumps, Mayor recalled being blown off course. A crosswind caught us and we ended up in Chattahoochee. Maybe a bit of an exaggeration there, but or exaggeration, but he got, uh, he got blown off course. They would need to be expert parachuters because their task was to go behind enemy lines and scout the heavily fortified area of Austria's Alpine Redoubt, also called the Alpine Fortress. The Alpine Redoubt was a redoubt. I'd never heard that word before this, uh, this week. That means it, it was an area that a country can retreat into following defeat in combat. Planned by Heinrich Himmler in November and December of 1943 for Germany's government and armed forces. Remember Himmler? Remember Himmler's crazy ass from the Nazi search for the Holy Grail suck and his pet insane occult and myth-obsessed fake psychic, Carl Villigat? We must have an alpine redoubt, Carl. We must guard it with the sewer giants from the underground Aryan cities you keep saying so much about. With the two sons and the more people or something. It's, uh, it's so hard to keep it straight. I, I could not do it alone. I could, I could not hope to stay safe in an alpine redoubt, Carl, with such a wonderful mind. Uh, this plan was never fully endorsed by Hitler and no serious attempt was made to put this plan into operation ever. But just this plan existing would end up serving as an effective tool of Nazi propaganda and military deception by the Germans in the final stages of the war. 
In the six months following the D-Day landings in Normandy in June of 1944, the American and British armies advanced to the Rhine River, and they seemed poised to strike into the heart of Germany while the Red Army advancing from the east through Poland reached the Oder River. It seemed like that Berlin was, you know, you know, fall very soon and Germany would be divided and crushed, but what if the Nazis could make it to their fabled Alpine fortress? A lot of faulty intelligence reports identified this non-existent fortress as having enough military supplies to keep tens of thousands of German soldiers fighting for around six months. They thought it could be, even be harboring weapons-producing facilities, which could extend the fighting possibly even further. Now, obviously, this additional fighting would cost the Allies you know, a lot of additional lives and billions in additional military spending. So where was this bad intelligence coming from? Uh, the Nazi minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, uh, set up a special unit to invent and spread rumors about the Alpine Fortress. And everyone bought his lies. He was very good at propaganda. Uh, the New York Times even ran an article with the ominous headline, Last Fortress of the Nazis, reporting, SS formations are likely to retreat swiftly southward to a region already selected as the last theater of operations in Europe. It will stretch from Lake Constance to the eastern approaches of Graz and Styria with an approximate length of 280 miles and a width of 100 miles a total land area slightly greater than that of Switzerland. It would be relatively easy to defend this fortress for a very long time behind the formidable barrier of a giant chain of Eastern Alps. The few gaps in the valleys can be sealed with more fortifications and pillboxes dug into the rocks. There is little doubt that the Tot organization is already being used to the limit for that purpose. We can assume that the Nazi command has started hoarding arms, munitions, oil, food, and textiles in a series of de uh, depots deep within the Alpine quadrangle. God, this is so great. Maybe we could find some, maybe we could find some yetis to cut the outer walls. Oh, what about a, what about a dragon? Oh, an ice dragon would be so cool, Carl. Use your wonderful mind to get us some dragons for our ice fortress. Uh, Goebbels sent out rumors that this mythical last stand stronghold uh, to neutral governments over and over, keeping the readout myth alive in, in a state of, un of readiness unclear. He even enlisted the assistance of the intelligence wing of Hitler's SS to produce fake blueprints, uh, fake reports on construction supplies, armament production, troop transfers to the readout. This complete and total deception of, alli of allied military intelligence considered to be one of the greatest World War II feats of Nazi military intelligence. According to U.S. General Omar Bradley, who would go on to become the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Alpine Fortress grew into so exaggerated a scheme that I am astonished we could have believed it as innocently as we did. But while it persisted, this legend of the redoubt was too ominous a threat to be ignored. So they were really worried about this. And the propaganda was jamming up all allied military plans for advancement. Once the allied armies had crossed the Rhine and advanced into Western Germany, a decision had to be made, whether to advance on a narrow front towards Berlin or in a simultaneous push by all Western armies spanning from the North Sea to the Alps to keep the Germans from retreating into these mountains into their redoubt. They needed, they needed to know more about this place. They needed some intel. And Operation Greenup would soon help with that. Uh, let's, check back, let's check back in with Mayer and Winberg now. Now done with parachuting qualifications, our inglorious bastards are undergoing more training. They're learning how to survive once they get on the ground. After learning parachuting at Fort Benning, the men are moved to California's Catalina Island, located 20 miles out of the Southern California coast, which had been a boys' summer camp before the war. And I kick myself every time this place comes up in stories. Lived in L.A. for six years, never once took a trip to Catalina Island. And I've heard only good things. I've heard it's great. Looks so cool. Dumped into the remote, unpopulated section of the island, they split into six-man teams, and Chapel instructed them to live off the land for five days on their own. They slept under the stars, officers and enlisted men alike, in only their sleeping bags. During an initial training exercise, the teams were ordered to capture an airport. In charge of one of the teams, Mayor later recalled that his team took the airport. We came in from the back. There were only a few guards protecting the airport, and we took them too. Mayor always approached things unconventionally. Instead of for, uh, mounting frontal attacks, he preferred taking the unexpected route and liked to use surprise to his advantage. After they'd successfully completed survival training at Catalina Island, uh, Chapel felt his OGs were ready for the real deal now. During the balmy early summer days of 1944, Fred and the other OGs finally get their call to action. They receive orders to get to Europe pronto. The ship they take to cross the Atlantic is packed with regular infantrymen as well as Chapel's group of 30 of America's special operations troops. Everyone on board takes a part in a guessing game as to where their final destination will be. The OGs think that they're headed for England. That's where they're supposed to meet up with OSS officers and get more mission details. After weeks of at sea playing cards, shooting craps, generally being bored out of their minds, they arrive in Oran, an Algerian port city, different continent. Oran had been captured by the Allies in 1942 and became an improvised depot for men and supplies on their way to the Italian front. 
It uh, suddenly became obvious to the OGs that no one in Oran knew we were coming and no one knew what to do with us, recalled Winberg. Soon they learned why. They were in the wrong fucking city. <laughs> At this point in the war, very few people had any idea uh, what the OSS was because it was still a very secret organization whose existence was disclosed only on a need-to-know basis. And really, unfortunately, OSS headquarters was equally disorganized. By the time the OGs arrived, there wasn't an OSS office in Oran or instructions on what to do with these guys. What a shit show. Can you imagine that? You're working for a secret organization that very few people know about. And the few people who do work in this organization with you, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> Good thing this mission wasn't, you know, super dangerous or anything. I picture some OSS dude, you know, maybe in like some like London headquarters panicking, you know, getting that, getting that feeling you get when you realize you've missed an appointment or slept through your alarm, and you're late for work, but like way worse. Or all of a sudden, around the time these guys land in Africa, he's like, oh, God, what, what day is it? What day? Oh, fuck. Oh, God. I forgot to tell anyone in Africa that the OSS guys were coming. Oh, this is bad. Oh, this is bad. Oh, shit. I think I, think I was supposed to send them to London. But almost no one knows they're supposed to be there but me. If I help them, I'll get in trouble. If I pretend I told them to just, you know, go there, <laughs> maybe, maybe I keep my day job. And maybe if I just don't talk about it. Maybe if I just don't talk about it, they'll probably be fine. They'll figure something out. Uh, I don't know if it went down exactly like that, but the OSS did fuck up big time. And and then they were not looking for Chapel and his men in Africa. They just kind of, uh, <laughs> they got misfiled and uh, they were just on their own. Uh, Winberg, uh, uh, or Ch I'm sorry, Chapel took matters into his own hands. He he finds out about an OSS secret base in Algiers. So then he obtains train tickets for all his recruits. Weinberg or Winberg later recalls the train ride there saying the train trip to Algiers was slow since the train stopped at least at a half dozen, half the train stopped in at least half a dozen villages in between. When the train stopped, it was immediately surrounded by dozens of yelling and gesticulating Arabs, youngsters, as well as grown-ups. We soon realized that they were we soon realized that they were aiming at buying our bedsheets to use as clothing. Without hesitation, I joined my fellow comrades in arms and making money by opening the windows at the next stop and with my bedsheets in hand, offered them to an Arab boy who was waving a pack of paper money notes. As the train pulled away, the boy grabbed the sheets and pushed notes in my hand. As I sat down to count my money, I realized that the top of the bunch of notes was indeed a low-value piece of paper money, while the rest was merely blank paper. He got, got, the old, let me pretend to buy your used bed sheets for 50 dinar, but really I'm just paying one dinar. You just got Algiers, Winberg. After a few hours' journey, the train rolls into Algiers, and the OGs disembark. They set up camp at about 20 miles outside of town. And then they find out that even though they've made it to Algiers, they're still in bureaucratic limbo. They sit at camp day after day now, wondering if they're going to be used at all in the war. God, it'd be so frustrating. Uh, Ch Chappelle, or Chapel, his name is spelled very closely to Chappelle. I keep, I keep thinking of Dave Chappelle. Uh, no. Chapel continued to push his men and made them to, you know, do exercises to ward off boredom. One such exercise, uh, once again narrated by Hans Winberg, went like this. Pepping it up with a, with a bit of music or some tone. In Algiers, we had, of course, nothing to do. So our officers had to think of keeping us busy. Our captain, a bit of a cowboy, ordered us, Freddie, Alfred, George, Bernie, and I, together with five others, to march to the airport and back to do this without rations. Only, can our, our, only our canteens with water. After a few hours of marching, we decided that we'd go into a village and into an eating place in this village. We were greeted with enthusiasm by the Algerian owner, whose daughter waited on us, waited on us and served us delicious eggs and pancakes. We left the cafe and pitched tents about two miles outside the village. As I woke up early the next morning, I saw a group of about two dozen Arabs marching towards our camp. I woke the rest of the fellows, and as the group arrived, it became clear after much shouting and gest gesticulation that the father of our waitress had the impression that if he talked to his daughter the way Alfred had, it meant marriage. <laughs> it took at least an hour of shouting and some money to convince the father that Alfred was not going to marry his daughter. Ooh, little, little uh, cultural mix-up here. <laughs> How nuts is it if that happened as he wrote it? That the daughter was talked to by an unchaperoned, you know, man. So a marriage must follow, right? Or she was, you know, there was no chaperone between them. They just talk at a cafe where he's having fucking pancakes and eggs. And then this guy's like, well, talk to my daughter, you know, 10 minutes straight. <laughs> you better fucking marry her. How insanely patriarchal. I picture this dad just so mad. Oh, you think you can disrespect me like that? Oh, you think you can chat on my daughter? Eat her pancakes that you pay for. Eat her eggs that she brought to you as a waitress. And then walk away? Without marrying her? What, are you some kind of playboy who just talks to waitresses at women? Or waitresses at restaurants? Left and right? Taking the precious uh, uh, talk to guy vocal hymens? What kind of demented pervert just chats women up where they work as a customer and then doesn't marry him? Uh, I love that they give him some money 
And he finally backs off. Oh, you think you can give me uh, 50 bucks? 50 bucks. That's real. Okay. All right. Well, her honor has been restored. Uh, after being trapped in North Africa for months, the OGs were eventually on the move again, again by ship. Captain Chapel has finally been able to contact OSS headquarters in Italy near the uh, near enemy lines and arranges for the group to travel to Europe to prep for their missions. Winberg says, In complete secrecy, we broke camp that morning at 5 a.m., got into our trucks, and headed for the harbor of Algiers. We were repeatedly told that we were traveling under great secrecy. We got aboard the ship, being greeted by the British soldiers and sailors, and as I wandered to find a place to sit for the trip to Italy, I noticed that the ship was tilting towards the shore where it was anchored. I went to the railing of the ship as 500 British soldiers and sailors were cheering and staring at a pretty French girl, <laughs> Jesus, standing on the waterfront, waving her arms and shouting, George, George, it was Gebner. Don't leave me, take me along. I feel like George did more than just order pancakes from that, from that lady. Uh, what the hell was going on down there? So many women, so, so desperate just to get the fuck out of Algiers, apparently. Uh, once they make it to Italy, once again, they do not have a mission. The OSS not running a real tight ship to kick this stuff off. Confined for weeks now to playing whatever games they could think of, just to cure boredom, just waiting around, uh, Mayer eventually has had enough. He decides now to grab an acoustic guitar and work on some more songs about all those women who wanted to leave Africa and how overly patriarchal things were down there. And he wrote, you know, one of his better songs, I think. Fathers, be good to your daughters. Daughters will love like you do. Girls become lovers. Turn into mothers. So mothers be good to your daughters too. Uh, that, may, that may be John Mayer again. Sorry, back to Fred Mayer. Uh, he, worst running gag of all time. He and some of the other men with him, without Chapel's permission, decided to go to Allied Intelligence in Caserta, located just outside of Naples, and try to get a mission assigned to them. Winberg later said, we essentially mutinied. They made their way to LTC Howard Chapin's office. Before the war, Chapman was an advertising exec for General Foods. Now he sends intelligence agents into Central Europe, including Austria and Germany, from marketing frosted flakes to managing spy missions. Finally, the men make some progress. They find a sympathetic listener. When the five men walk into his office, Chapman nods and asks them to take a seat. They take turns telling Chapman their unique stories as to why they're there. Mayer spoke first and spoke directly, as was his way. As he recalled later, I told him I was Jewish and that I wanted to jump behind the lines to help end the war. I said he wanted to kill some Nazis. Uh, they spoke uh, turn by turn, made it clear that they knew that getting caught, you know, likely meant a uh, death sentence, not only because they were enemy spies, but because they were Jewish. Each of them wanted to return to Germany specifically to lay down their lives for the country that had taken them in. After hearing all of them out, Chapman nodded, said plainly, you will hear from me. True to his word, the next day he ordered that the Jewish five be sent to uh, Bari, an Italian seaport, from where they would soon be transported behind enemy lines. Upon arrival in Bari, they were escorted into the offices of Lieutenant Alfred C. Ulmer, Jr., a sales and advertising exec before the war. Pulled from the ranks of the Navy, the 28-year-old Floridian, Floridian, there we go, ran the day-to-day -day operations at OSS's German-Austrian section in Bari. The section's tasks involved inserting agents into the heart of Hitler's Third Reich, perhaps the most difficult of OSS's spy missions. So far, their mission results had been uh, mixed. Actually, prior to May or in Operation Greenup, uh, nearly all of their missions into the Austrian Germany or into the German-Austrian territory had been uh, doomed, not mixed. Uh, which meant, of course, that a lot of OSS agents had died. Their first mission, DuPont, in which the team was dropped by parachute near, in which a team was dropped by parachute near Vienna in October of 1944, had been a disaster. Uh, the team was led by Jack Taylor, former dentist from California who'd become an OSS agent. Their parachute drop was successful, but then the radio that they brought, you know, to talk back to uh, base fell into a lake. So shit. And I thought dropping my iPhone in a, in a toilet was bad. They nonetheless continued with their mission, found several safe houses from which they did some spying. They got a lot of data, including the locations of some anti-tank ditches, artillery sites, and more, as well as some good targets for Allied bombing raids. But then their entire mission went sideways when one of Taylor's men bought a local girl a diamond ring and proposed to her. The big purchase uh, aroused the interest of the Gestapo, who quickly arrested the team member and took Taylor into custody after you know hearing about Taylor from the team member. He was tortured, sent to a Matthausen concentration camp where he refused to transmit a false message back to OSS headquarters. He was forced to carry unbelievably heavy loads then of rock up steep hills that were guarded by SS uh, guards with whips who frequently tossed prisoners too weak to work off the fucking cliffs at the top of the quarry. Not a great place to be taken to. Uh, when Mauthausen was finally liberated by the Allies in 1945, Taylor had withered away from an already very lean 165 pounds to a skeletal 115 pounds. Holy shit. 
But he and his team were rescued, uh, you know, days before their scheduled executions by Allied forces. So at least they survived. Also, after hearing that, I wondered, did that girl say yes after all that shit? How much more mad at you if you're getting tortured over some guy in your unit asking a girl to marry him who wasn't even interested? I just picture Taylor wasting away, carrying load after load of rock up some horribly steep hill, getting whipped, mumbling to himself like a madman. She didn't even say yes. She didn't, she didn't like him. She didn't even, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to fucking die. Because corporal dipshit doesn't even know the difference between romantic interest and just being polite. <laughs> they didn't even go on a date. She, she looked at him. She just looked at him from across the beer house. And now I'm carrying fucking rocks. Get whipped by some Nazis. <laughs> yeah, life is funny. Another mission recently, uh, another recently failed OSS mission was ORCID. Uh, not long after being dropped behind enemy lines, the Orchid agents mysteriously disappeared. Strongly assumed that enemy forces wiped them out somewhere in Yugoslavia. Another failed mission uh, had been codenamed Dylan. Operatives were dropped in Nazi-occupied Austria in December of 1944. The team got some useful intelligence, but then Gestapo captured one of the teammates in February of 1945. That teammate ratted out the rest of the group, and all of the agents were executed. Uh, back in the office now, Omer lays this out for Mayer and Winberg, and it doesn't scare them away. Then he inquires about the prospective agent's background. He asked each man if he could kill, if he would kill. Mayer responded, yes, without hesitation. Classic Mayer. And Hans Winberg actually uh, allegedly says no. And immediately following saying no, their old combat instructor, Fairbairn, he drops down from the ceiling. He'd been hanging from a fucking rafter by only his pinky toes. We've been hiding for weeks, staying alive by intimidating humidity in the air and just soaking into his skin for hydration. A reverse sweat technique that he had invented. He grabbed Winberg by the throat, held a 16-inch 16 inch knife to his stomach, a knife he had made out of two gum wrappers and a sesame seed. And he said, what do you mean? You're not going to kill Nazis. This isn't a Sadie Hawkins dance, kid. It's a fucking gutter fight. And of course that didn't happen. Uh, Omer was just like, okay. And then they just moved on. He asked again if they really understood the risk. Do you, do you appreciate what can happen to you? Mayor said, this is more our war than yours. All right, fair enough. Omer knew that things in Germany would not go well for the spies if they were discovered, especially because after the failed July 20th, 1944 plot to kill Hitler, the Gestapo and the SS were given wider authority to roll up enemies of the state, as I mentioned earlier in the timeline, and just execute them. A reign of terror now enveloped the southern Alpine districts, including Tyrol, the Austrian state, where they'd be dropped. Omer couldn't believe these guys actually wanted to go there willingly. The five Jewish operatives, uh, you know, these two guys and three others, were soon met by two fellow Jewish refugees, Dino Lowenstein and Walter Haas, both had escaped the horrors of Nazi Germany before the onset of the war. We're now working for the OSS. Omer divided them in, into teams, gave each, uh, uh, gave each room, oh my God, gave each team a room. There we go. That's how you talk. In an old Italian mansion known as the Villa Suppa. Lowenstein and Haas instructed them to create their own missions based on personal expertise and knowledge about German politics, geography, culture. Real life and glorious bastards, Fred Mayer, Hans Winberg, share a room. The men are given code names. Hans becomes Hugh Wynn. Frederick becomes Fred. Oh, actually, he stays Frederick because his name uh, works. And Paul uh, Koch was given the nickname or name alias George Mitchell. They also got more lessons on how to identify German units, operate undetected behind enemy lines. Uh, some of their training was a little less uh, sophisticated and comprehensive than other aspects, uh, like this moment described by Hans Winberg. When we got up in the morning before we sat down for breakfast, Lowenstein made our very small group of OSS members stand up and take out our 45 caliber pistols. Then he took out his pistol, removed the clip and bullets, told us to do the same, and then pointing the gun at some fictitious German, he would squeeze the trigger over and over, telling us that was the only exercise we needed. Just pull the trigger when you see a German. Okay, pretty direct, pretty pretty plain instructions. Lowenstein also sent the two friends on several mock missions to hone their spy craft. One mission involved their posing as German agents, wearing allied uniforms, and infiltrating Italy's uh, Brindisi, uh, Brindisi, uh, Brindisi, there we go. Brindisi Harbor, under British control at the time. Given the task of purloining maps of the harbor's defenses, the men got to work quickly. They infiltrated the harbor compound wearing no insignia on their uniforms. They found the people in charge, offered a sergeant a bottle of scotch, which he accepted, and then just like that, they walked out with their maps. Turned out, uh, turns out they were good actors. Now knowing that they had the real deal, the only remaining question for the OSS was if Mayer's German could cut the mustard behind enemy lines. So they developed one last test. Insert Mayer into a POW cage with captured Germans for three days and see if he could pass himself off as a real German soldier. It's pretty fucking crazy, but smart. They put this guy in a cage with POWs who fought for the man, you know, who wanted Mayer and every other Jew in the world dead. Who knows how many of those POWs, you know, were strident, aggressively anti-Semitic Nazis, but I have to imagine many of them were, how badly he must have wanted to kill some of them. 
Fred Mayer starts his three-day mission in the German POW cage in January of 1945, a Jewish man dressed as a German officer. Many of the people in the POW camp were proud and unbroken, still sure that Hitler would be victorious. Mayer had to say, Heil Hitler, to the others as a greeting to keep up his ruse. Turns out his German was solid. No one suspected he was not a fellow German soldier. It would be in this POW camp that Fred would meet the third member of the eventual Operation Greenup, the third member to go behind enemy lines, John Matrix. John Matrix was from East Germany, a devout, loving father who had actually retired from the military life years earlier, but then ended up back in combat, doing whatever he felt he needed to do to protect his beloved daughter, Jenny. Years after he thought he'd left his life of war behind, his former superior, General Franklin Kirby, informed him that members of his old unit had just been killed by mercenaries hired by a ruthless warlord known as President Arius. Matrix tried to shrug off the warning, but then some of those mercenaries loyal to Arius attacked him, kidnapped his daughter, and he had to fight to get her back. Wait, uh, no, Fred did not meet John Matrix. John Matrix is Arnold Schwarzenegger's character in Commando, 1985 action blockbuster. I was just reading in that movie's plot description. No, Fred met, <laughs> Fred met Franz Weber. I wonder if anybody picked that up. You'd have to be a real diehard commando fan. Like, oh yeah. Uh, Fred met uh, Franz Weber, a real German soldier in this POW cage. And Franz Weber, not an ordinary soldier, born and raised in the Austrian city of Innsbruck, the 24-year-old veteran of the Wehrmacht, Polish, Russian, and Yugoslavian campaigns, battle-tested German officer, but not a big fan of Hitler. Uh, Mayer figured out while undercover that Franz, not anti-Semitic. He did not think Jewish people were the evil pest that the Nazi regime made them out to be. When he traveled through Poland in April of 1941, he'd seen weak and starving Jewish people, and he felt terrible for them, wanted to help them. In short, this guy was in Hitler's army because he'd been born and raised in Germany, not because he was a member of Hitler's fan club. Also, if he deserted and got caught, they would execute him. Fred Mayer made it through his three days in the POW camp without breaking cover. Then back at Villa Sapa, he told Lowenstein about Weber, saying, frankly, I trust him. Lowenstein agrees that Weber is a potential asset. Weber is brought to the villa for some vetting. When Weber sees the person he thought was a German officer sitting in the Italian villa with the OSS, his jaw reportedly hit the floor in surprise. Mayer asked him, are you willing to parachute behind enemy lines with us? Yes, Weber replied, without a moment of hesitation. They then introduced him to Hans Winberg, and Fred Mayer declared that he was willing to risk his life alongside the two of them. And now we have the power trio of the real and glorious bastards. And now they begin to plan Operation Green up in earnest. Uh, they'll need two major things, equipment and a pilot for the mission. For the pilot, they find Lieutenant John Billings, a man who'd done scores of missions behind the lines to, to deliver allied agents into the Reich. If they're crazy enough to jump, we're crazy enough to fly them, said Billings. For, some of the, for the equipment, Lowenstein and Haas raided the, raided the supply room to equip Operation Green up and took the following items out of storage. 14 boxes of rations, skis, one British type hand generator, a Eureka homing beacon, complete with gelatin batteries that were fully charged, uh, various weapons, including roughly a thousand knives, thanks to gutter fighter, uh, Fairburn, right? That training he'd instilled in them. Uh, all of that was true, except for the knives part, as far as the numbers. Uh, they put their supplies into three containers, each with colored parachutes. They also took some creature comforts, four cartons of cigarettes, a box of cigars, two pounds of tobacco, and several, <laughs> not making this up, several packages of condoms. I uh, love it. Adventure can come in many forms on a dangerous mission. Hail to Safina. Mayer and Weber also carried leg bags that held their personal items, rucksacks, clothing, food supplies, even 60 small flashlight batteries for the radio. And maybe most importantly, they brought a fuck ton of Whipple. And that brings me to one more sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by new fan favorite sponsor, the energy drink Whipple. Hey, I'm Whipple President and CEO Gunther Whipple. And I have more money than you and a bigger dick. Is that because I drink Whipple? No, I'm just bigger, better, stronger, smarter. People keep asking, what's in Whipple? And after I'm done punching their fucking bitch faces into oblivion, I tell them Whipple is made with a mixture of cocaine, caffeine, gunpowder, stop asking questions and shut the fuck up. Order a case of Whipple now and get a free alarm clock. Wake up and smell the Whipple. Get out of bed, you lazy piece of shit. It's Whipple o'clock. Grab life by the dick and suck that cock. Fuck you, fuck your family, and drink Whipple! Now available in black cherry guillotine and lemon lime head wound flavors. Man, Whipple's been buying a lot of ads lately. I'm not sure how they make enough money to have a marketing budget, but you know what? I'll take it. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say no to Gunther. Uh, let's get back to the radio the trio uh, brought brought. Obviously, they didn't pack any Whipple. Uh, the radio was the most important item they packed by far. It was their lifeline in the mission, the tech that would enable them to send coded messages back about what they discovered. Everything would be coded, including locations. German and Austrian cities in the mission's radius were given uh, pseudonyms. 
Innsbruck was Brooklyn. Munich with Jersey. Uh, Garmisch was Flatbush. Ober Salzburg, Bay Ridge, and Switzerland was the Bronx. They transposed the area around New York City onto their map. They were ready, no sleep till Brooklyn. They were get, uh, they were to get some real info. Was the you know one of the object- objectives? My God, of their mission on the mythical Nazi Alpine fortress, if possible, was it real? Uh, there were numerous other mission intel objectives. The mission was planned to begin with a flight over potentially flak filled skies, deep into enemy territory. The plane would have to dangerously fly through the canyon like crags of the Alps and arrive exactly at a pinpoint drop zone where the men would parachute onto a fucking glacier. This was some James Bond Mission Impossible type shit. The slightest deviation to the left or right could have them careening over the side of sheer cliffs or getting their chutes entangled in the rocky fingers of the Alps. The first two times they planned to do the drop, they had to back out at the last minute because of weather. But then on February 26, 1945, go time. Their blacked out B-52 bombers supercharged, quad 1200 horsepower engines roared as the plane plummeted down the mountain range, rushing by snow-capped peaks. John Billings, as he'd done many times in the past, skirted disaster as the plane blew powdery snow off of the gray crags while treacherous updrafts from the valley floor threatened to smash the bomber against the mountains. Using lakes and other landmarks as signposts, the plane soon approached the drop zone. In the back of the cigar-shaped interior, the three agents of Operation Greenup, Fred Mayer, Hans Winberg, and Franz Weber, got ready to jump through the Joe Hole and head down over 10,000 feet. The plane slowly uh, slowed briefly, and they jumped. And then several minutes later, their feet plunged into the deep powder, all three landing within 100 yards of each other. For the next few hours, they fumbled through chest-deep snow, uncovered their equipment, minus the package in which they'd packed two pairs of skis. They lost that one. Without the skis, they would assemble a crude sled. Wild shit. Drop behind enemy lines. If they get caught and their captors find out who they are, they are fucking dead. No allies can save them. They are on their own. This feels more like a movie to me than a real historical event. I have a hard time processing this as uh, real life. Six balls of steel. Dropped from the sky that day into the snow on a German glacier. Hail Nimrod! The morning of February 27th dawned cold and bright around 6 a.m. with the first light creeping over the glacier. The men resumed their journey down the glacier. It takes hours to go even a mile in the snow. After 10 hours of crawling and trudging, they spot a landmark, a stone building that had been a skier's lodge before it was abandoned. Inside, they find blankets, beds, wood for the fire, and some dough and uh, and pickled vegetables. Jackpot! They nursed themselves, tried to contact the OSS base with the radio, but were unsuccessful. They spend the next few days resting inside the lodge, probably jerking off a bit, let's be honest, and recovering before setting out again. Greenup's current cover story was that the German, uh, uh, was that the German, Weber, uh, using the name Eric uh, Schmitzer, had captured two American pilots and was bringing them into custody. Finally, they make it to the small German town of Greece. Uh, Weber, such an asset, knew the area like the back of his hand and confidently brought them to the town's mayor, a top Nazi official. Weber told him, I know sometimes they say Weber, Weber. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, probably Weber. Weber told him, I am Lieutenant Eric Schmitzer, and I was accidentally detached from my Alpine Corps unit. I need your assistance to get to the bottom of the glacier. He introduces Mayer and Winberg now with a new cover story that better suits this moment as Dutch collaborators who are also separated from the unit, and they all need to get back as quickly as possible to Innsbruck. The mayor is more than happy to comply and gives them a sled, and now they have even uh, an, an even more perilous journey than walking had been. The sled would often go apparently up to 60 miles an hour (laughs) down the slopes and a bump in the wrong place could have led to a deadly wipeout. Oh my, that's so fast. Uh, Fred and Hans later said it was the scariest part of the journey. But uh, to Franz Weber, an experienced sledder, it was routine. I love love the description, experienced sledder. I don't think you run into a lot of experienced sledders anymore. At least not in this country. Uh, The trio now made their way to a railroad line that would take them to Inzing. On the train, they were approached by some Gestapo, some Nazi secret police who demanded to see their papers. Franz handed them over, cool as a cucumber. If they were identified as forgeries, you know, no big whoops. They're just going to be executed. Uh, Their forgeries look legit. They live for now. They disembark at Inzing, one stop before Innsbruck, hoping that the smaller city wouldn't have the same checkpoints that a larger city would. And they were right. After about an hour on foot, they reach uh, the little roughly 1,000-person town on the outskirts of Innsbruck, uh, Oberf... uh, Oberperfuss. Oberperfuss. It's, it's It's not a name that rolls off the tongue. At least not mine. I found a few videos. It's very cute. Uh, they were. Uh, they then went to the former mayor's house, who was an anti-Nazi and a friend of Franz Weber's. And he uh, risked. I can't. I can't make up my mind. Weber. Weber. Uh, he risked his life to welcome them in. I keep thinking of Weber Grill. I'm like, ah, is that the Americanized version or the German version? Over the next couple of days, the team moved around, hiding in different safe houses, attempting to uh, radio their OSS mission contacts. Then on March 7th, Winberg first hears from headquarters. 
following day, he sends back a message. All well. Patience until March 13th, Hans. Use a small circle of family and friends still in Germany. Uh, mayor builds a solid set of operatives to support his team. Louise, the mayor, farmer's daughter, uh, mayor met, at, at, had, he had the hots for, named Thomas Marie and uh, Annie, Weber's, uh, Weber's fiance. Fuck, I'll say Weber. Uh, were recruited as couriers, as were Weber's two sisters, Eva and Gretel. It's rumored by me and no one else that Mayer wrote, Your Body is a Wonderland for Thomas Marie. Your body is a wonderland. Your body is a wonder, Thomas Marie. I'll stop. These individuals carried messages from Mayer to Winberg, allowing Winberg and his radio to remain hidden. Fred eventually grew tired of staying hidden, and he assembled a German officer's uniform, whatever pieces people would give him, and some phony uh, documents uh, he got uh, that said he lost his credentials in northern Italy. This allowed him to go around town during the day, uh, you know, going to little taverns and stuff at night, hanging out with people while dressed as a German officer, got to fool people. He soon made his way into Innsbruck to go after some mission objectives. For the next three weeks, he'll talk to different people in Innsbruck, establishing contacts with various people who are part of uh, the local anti-Nazi resistance. March 21st, 1945, Mayer is now starting to get some real intel about Hitler's legendary Alpine redoubt. He makes his way into a into a beer hall-like room for recovering soldiers where wounded men sit around tables temporarily enjoying an oasis from the horrors of war, kind of like a, like a veterans group. There the men tell stories about their experiences and sometimes give valuable information about Germany's military tactics. One drunken Austrian engineer even tells Fred uh, about Hitler's whereabouts, the most closely guarded secret of the Third Reich at that time. Mary would strain to remember all the details from the conversation when he would write them on a document dated March 21st. Number one, Führer headquarters is one and a half kilometers southeast of the Zazen Lager rail station. Zazen is at RZ91 near, Ber near Berlin, located in a group of five houses parallel and facing each other, with one house lengthways in the center of the east end. Hitler's house is the first one on the southwest end. The houses are built out of reinforced concrete. The walls are one meter thick, and the lowest floor is 13 meters underground with four ceilings, each one meter thick above it. Their roofs are steep and camouflage green, black, and white. In the center of the house group is the air raid warning tower. Tower. God, how exciting would that be to think you like, okay, if I can get this information, they might be able to fucking bomb Hitler and kill him. Hitler is now at the Reich Quansley, where he meets generals of uh, where he meets general of staff nightly at 2200 GMT. Two courier trains, each with 24 cars, are kept constantly under steam. One at Pebruke, two kilometers south of Drevitz, R763, and one with SS guards at Barth. Hitler's alternative headquarters is not at Obersalzburg, but in Ordruf. Hitler is tired of leaving. I guess I, sorry, I stopped in the numbers. This is like the little fifth note he had, uh, the last one. Hitler is tired of, uh, sorry, of living. He watched the last air raid prior to March 21st from his balcony, but only the officer's club was hit. Uh, the intel, uh, not wrong. Hitler would kill himself just barely over a month later. He was tired of living. Uh, Mayor spent the next week gathering more gems of info from the loose lips of convalescing Nazi officers. The next day on March 22nd, Winberg radios back to OSS headquarters saying Old Dolomite, frontier of 1917 being rebuilt and occupied by Volkstrom, already called up in South Tyrol, source Volkstrom leader. Uh, the Volkstrom was Hitler's Hail Mary. It was a national militia established by Nazi Germany during the last months of World War II, arming as many men as they could between the ages of 16 and 60 who weren't already in the army. Just a last-ditch, desperate attempt to stop the Allies from infiltrating Germany. Uh, Winberg also radios that there are doubts amongst local soldiers that the Alpine fortress is real. On March 25th, Fred Mayer reports the presence of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, providing details even down to the hotel the Italian dictator was staying in. He'd give this intel just a month before Mussolini was uh, captured and executed. This intel didn't lead to Mussolini's death, but had the war gone on longer, it could have. Mayor soon exhausted the intelligence available from the soldiers, so he moved on to another one of Greenup's objectives, getting intelligence about the rail and road traffic moving from Germany to the Italian front. Mayor gathered perhaps his most valuable intelligence at the end of March and beginning of April towards this end when he strode into the rail yard and watched German soldiers and railroad, railroad workers loading the trains and preparing the tracks. Miraculously, he was lucky enough to run into Inbrook's yardmaster. Uh, oh boy, there's a lot of trains, Mayor said nonchalantly to the man. The yardmaster replied, wait, wait till tomorrow morning. Assembled at Hall, we can have over 26 trains, each with 30 to 40 cars loaded with ammo and tanks that will be leaving April 3rd and going straight through the Brenner. Nice. Also, the real master volunteered information about how the Nazis always managed to repair their bridges after bombings by the Allied Air Corps or Air Corps. 
Uh, Mayor said, thanks, pal. Can't wait to tell my allied leaders about, I mean, how Hitler and stuff. Huh? Uh, of course he didn't say that. He just kept listening to this yard master who just kept talking. The guy told Mayor that the bridges were collapsible. That's how they kept popping them back up and were stored in tunnels scattered through the crags of the Alps th during the day to avoid detection by the ever-present allied fighter bombers. At night, they would be rolled out to allow trains to move through the Brenner Pass. And that shit is crazy. I tried to find more info on these Nazi collapsible bridges, but unfortunately could not. Uh, Mayor then wrote what would be one of his most important messages ever detailing this info. He then moved on to getting information about German jet production, one of the OSS's uh, highest priorities. This would be harder. He couldn't just walk into the jet factory posing as a German officer, but there was another way he could get in and get his intel. He could sing his way in, right? So he grabbed his guitar, he sat outside the jet factory, and quickly got some people's attention singing his song, Gravity. Whoa, whoa gravity is working against me. And gravity wants to bring me down. Come on, even if you hated all the other Forrest John Mayer references, you have to admit, that one kind of tracks. It kind of plays. It kind of fits in there. Of course, he didn't sing his way in. The war was coming to an end, and Innsbruck was becoming a magnet for displaced foreign workers fleeing the chaos and destruction of advancing armies. From one of his contacts, Mayer learned that a jet factory in the mountains around Kemeton, uh, less than 10 miles from Innsbruck, was looking for more workers. In Kempton, German engineers had hollowed out the side of a mountain and built an underground factory that produced the ME-262 jet. With a top speed of well over 500 miles per hour, at least 93 miles per hour faster than any Allied aircraft, the ME-262 was well ahead of its time, and in the hands of experienced Luftwaffe pilots, the plane was deadly. Of course the OSS would like to know as much about it as possible. Frederick Mayer now pretended to be a French electrician, complete with civilian clothes and a dark blue beret, he got papers smuggled in by the OSS confirming his new identity and biked 80 miles to the factory. He was hired on the spot, and for the next week, he worked in the machine shop. So impressive. Responsible for maintaining the electrical inside of the assembly line. Bullshitted his way into making them think he uh, knew what he was doing. This guy was fucking good. I don't think there's any way I could pull something like that off. You know, I'd probably just, uh, like, if I got the job, I'd end up just standing there like a jackass, just, like, just touching the same two wires together over and over. Just, ah, that looks good. No, not quite. Just almost. Oh, no, oh, all right, okay. Uh, you know, uh, get caught pretty quick. Just getting into all sorts, just getting all sorts of intel, pretending to be various people over there. Uh, he now learns there's not enough raw materials to complete production. So the assembly line isn't doing shit. It's idle. This is great news for the allies. He sends his info back to Winberg, who reports to OSS that production in the Kemeton factory had been idle for the last three months because of a lack of supplies. Big intel win for the OSS that will, of course, affect battle strategy. Now Mayer has bigger and better ideas than intelligence on his mind. He suddenly wants to capture Innsbruck for the Allies. Gutter fight, motherfuckers! Uh, the message Winberg sent to the OSS was this, if desired, can take Innsbruck, an area ahead of airborne landings. Political prisoners would need 500 pistols. Details await answer. Hoping to mount an insurrection, killing in the name of. Uh, he had some key allies who were top officials who could liberate political prisoners and put troops under mayor's command. Mayor proposed capturing key drop zones and creating roadblocks ahead of an Allied airborne assault. Not a completely unrealistic proposition, considering that the Allies had the 13th Airborne Division as well as other airborne units in reserve. This particular plan, though, would never get off the ground. But Fred Mayer would soon be instrumental in liberating Innsbruck. Uh, on April 14th, 1945, Mayer, Winberg, and Weber, Weber, along with Mayer's girlfriend and top agent Thomas Marie, that's right, official girlfriend now, wonder if he has any condoms left by this point. Uh, several other Confederates making 10 in all assemble at 11.30 p.m. on April, uh, 11, sorry, 11.30 p.m. this night to await the first attempt to deliver supplies to help mount a takeover uh, over Innsbruck. The drop was to consist of eight large uh, cylinder, oh man, this word, I fucking hate this word. Cylindrical, <laughs> cylindrical. I think it's cylindrical. Like cylinder, I get that. Cylinder, but then you add the ickle on the end of like, it's not cylinderical. Uh, <laughs> cylindrical. Uh, you know what? If I fuck up, whatever. Uh, eight large cylinder, <laughs> fucking eight large round containers. They're <laughs> each weighing up to 275 pounds and holding everything from a German contacts camera, pistols, ammunition, radio, 50 gold pieces, 10 tubes of insulin for a desperate diabetic Nazi who had agreed to work with Mayer in return for access to the life-saving serum. But the plane never arrived. The next night, in case the plane maybe just showed up late, Fred decided to stay at a nearby hotel Despite SS troops combing the area, Mayer manages to slip back into Innsbruck, where Winberg informs him that Ulmer had rescheduled the supply drop for Monday, April 16th. Then when Monday, April 16th comes, Mayer's crew once again arrives at the drop site with a truck. But the plane's second engine 
burst into flames on the way, and the bomber nosed downward before it could identify the drop zone. To avoid smashing into the mountainside, the pilot ordered all the cargo be immediately jettisoned. The cargo landed on the side of a mountain miles away from the drop zone. All on board, the plane survived, but Mayer did not get his supplies. No one would find those supply containers until the war was over and the snow had melted. Mayer now goes back to gathering intelligence, so much for the takeover. No insurrection. And actually, he wouldn't gather that much more intelligence either. The USS was closing in on him. April 20th, uh, 1945, just 10 days before Hitler will die, SS agents Walter Gutner and August Schiffer are hot on Fred Mayer's trail. On the afternoon of April 20th, Gutner captured one of Mayer's black market contacts and another one of his sources and tortured some info about Mayer out of them. Then at 11 p.m., these fuckers pounded on the door of Eva and Gretel Weber's tiny apartment in Innsbruck, where Mayer was hiding. Inside, Mayer heard men's voices, shot off the couch, threw his incriminating documents into the fire. Then six men burst into the room with MP40 pistols, like machine gun, like, you know, automatic pistols drawn. Are you Frederick Mayer? One of them demanded. We, Mayer said, trying to act like he's still French, uh, like he's being interrogated for not showing up to work as the French electrician, you know, at the factory. Put on your shoes, one of them barked. And then remembering Fairbairn's training, Mayer suddenly yelled, gutter fight, motherfuckers! And then he immediately turned some of his own eyelashes into makeshift throwing knives and violently sent them through the air by blinking really hard. He killed both Nazis before they knew what the hell was happening. Or he put on his shoes like they asked him to. And he was taken outside and stuffed in the backseat of a green van and whisked to Gestapo headquarters in Innsbruck, you know, or, or that. There he was brought into an interrogation room where he kept pretending to be the French worker. Eventually, they showed him the contacts they'd arrested, and Mayer knew that they now knew he was an American. The ruse was up. Right, not good. He now claimed to be an American agent who had traveled alone to Austria from Switzerland, and they didn't buy that. His Nazi captors now cut off his clothes, discovered $600 in gold coins on him. Bad news for Mayer. They started slapping him around, believing that he was Jewish. Mayer wasn't breaking. The more they hit me, the less inclined I was to talk, he'd later say. In Patrick Donald's book, they dared return the true story of Jewish spies behind the lines in Nazi Germany. The author describes the beating Mayer took this way. And since this real life story has kind of like a crime noir vibe, this feels like the, the right background music. In the dark room, the Gestapo officer slapped and punched the spy in the face. His cover wasn't holding water, so the tall one stripped him from head to toe. Despite the agent's bullish strength, the SS men brutally manhandled him, shoving him to the floor cuffing his hands in front of him and pulling his arms over his bent knees. They forced him into a constricting fetal position, then shoved the barrel of a long rifle into the tiny gap between behind his knees and his cuffed hands. With a man on each side of the rifle, they lifted his naked, rolled-up body and suspended the human ball between two tables, like pieces of meat on a skewer. Uncoiling a rawhide whip, the tall one put his full weight behind each swing, mercilessly thrashing the agent's body like a side of beef. Then the Nazis asked, where is the radio operator? Where is the radio operator? When the whipping didn't work, the Gestapo men decided to waterboard their prisoner. They brought out two pitchers of water and tipping their captive's face to the ceiling, they poured the cold liquid down his mouth and nose. Mayor felt like he was drowning. The Nazis had it down to his science. One man poured while the second refilled the other pitcher. The torture assembly line kept running for six hours. In between beatings, one of the SS agents shoved a pistol into Mayer's mouth, breaking his front and back teeth. They also whipped his genitals with a cowhide whip, bloodying them. Holy shit, that would hurt. I mean, based on some horrific ball-busting videos I've watched, well, because I, I work with Joe Paisley, I know that some dudes seem to enjoy that, but not me. God, you start whipping my balls bloody? I'm going to talk, okay? I'm going to spill some secrets. Uh, you know who ball whipping would not work on for sure? serial killer Albert Fish, right? The party just beginning to start off that son of a bitch. Showbiz, put your back into it, back at Meow. Take another crack. Can and will come again. That's how they do it in Hollywood. Uh, don't worry about that uh, if you didn't get it, if you're, if you're new. Check out the Albert Fish episode. If you must know, uh, maybe listen to it alone. Eventually, Mayor's torturers threw him naked into a cold, damp cell. The weather was freezing, which ironically did help his uh, uh, wounds from becoming infected. One of the guards, an old man, took pity on him, reached through the bars to loosen the rope that bound Mayer's hands, gave him a handkerchief to wipe off his wounds, offered him a half a ham sandwich, but Mayer's fucked up teeth were too broken for him to eat it. At the same time, same time that Mayer was tortured, Herman Mattel, another American-led OSS agent, was being interrogated by the Gestapo as well. Mattel is kind of an interesting figure in all this. He was uh, from the same German POW camp in Italy where Franz Weber had been held and was also tapped, you know, like uh, him to be an OSS spy. Uh, but he had some baggage, he had some bad kidneys, had a tendency towards bragging, which raised a red flag with the uh, agents in charge of his operation. He also had a bad hand wound. 
though it didn't impede his ability to parachute out of an airplane. It actually would be his hand that would give him a good cover story. Part of Operation Deadwood, the OSS gave him papers that said he was going to travel back to Germany for treatment on his hand. He jumped blind into northern Italy or Austria, carry packages from soldiers at the front addressed to their families, disguising his spy radio in his suitcase. A couple of the packages he carried weren't even from families. They were just sugar. He was on a unique mission, rare for the OSS to send a single volunteer instead of a group. Everyone wondered, could he be trusted? What were his real motivations? Once he got behind enemy lines, would he become a double agent? They also had to make sure his hand kept looking injured. So they got uh, Chris, uh, Chris, Chris Robin, an anti-parasitic and a powerful skin irritant that Matta was supposed to apply to keep his skin inflamed and scarred. So strange, but only gave him a minor rash. So they had to look out for some, or had to look for some other chemical. The doctor wrote down the ingredients in a file for something new, menthol 0.5, phenol 3.0, Psilocylic acid, 1.5, petroleum, 9330, will burn skin, poison. Now his skin was all kinds of irritated. What strange sacrifices these spies had to make to do their work. Uh, Mattel parachuted and landed seven miles uh, north of Genbach, Austria. From there, he took a train to Munich and reported that he thought he was being followed. Ended up getting caught because he was openly smoking some American cigarettes, lighting them with American matches. That was all it took. All that hand skin irritation nonsense for nothing. He evaded the Gestapo for nearly a week when they started looking for him, uh, but then they finally captured him. In an interrogation, Madel was shown a picture of Mayer's beaten up face and asked if he knew the man. And, and, and Madel, a uh, former German soldier, saved the American Jewish soldier's life by doing some quick thinking. Madel claimed that Mayer was a big shot in American command and that if Mayer was shot, the Americans would kill everyone who had mistreated him. Beautiful, this worked. Madel even insisted that the man as, a, as senior as Mayer should only be interrogated by regional Nazi party leaders at the Austrian state of Tyrol, which Innsbruck was the capital of. And that man would be the top of their uh, regional govern, you know, government would be Franz Hofer, also an interesting guy to talk about. Hofer was a bona fide Nazi, an early leader of the nascent Austrian Nazi party. He'd formally put his life on the line for his Nazi beliefs. In 1933, serving as the regional Nazi party leader, AKA the Gauleiter, he was imprisoned by the Austrian government for his activities. Four SA men dramatically broke into the prison to free the 31-year-old Hofer and shot their way out. Wounded amid, the gun, wounded amid the gunfire, Hofer and the Nazis escaped to Germany, and from a stretcher, he addressed the Nazi party rally at Nuremberg only two weeks after the prison break. Following the German annexation of Austria, he was again appointed Nazi party leader of the Tyrol region. During the war, Hofer's power in the region grew to enormous proportions, and on September 1st, 1940, he was appointed governor of Tyrol, which is that uh, position of like Gauleiter. Uh, following Italy's ca capitulation in the summer of 1943, Hofer is chosen to be the Supreme Commissar in the operation zone of the Alpine foothills, which included Tyrol, as well as some neighboring Italian provinces. But now, Hofer, the ardent Nazi, believed that the defeat of Germany was inevitable. To the east, the Russian army was fighting in Berlin, while to the west, the Allies were advancing through Italy. America's 7th Army, including the 103rd Infantry Division, was advancing on Innsbruck from the west. He wasn't an idiot. Now he was looking for a way to surrender to the Americans rather than to the Red Army, hopefully get better treatment. He ordered the Gestapo to bring Mayer to him. Meanwhile, the Gestapo was looking for Hans Winberg. Uh, they brought Fred Meyer along for their raid on April 22nd when they reached the home of the farmer who quartered Winberg. They found the spare parts for the radio, extra equipment, gold pieces, a chemistry book, and three chemistry textbooks that Winberg had been reading. The Gestapo investigator then interrogated the farmer and his 19-year-old son, pressing them for more info. And they confessed, saying that they did know Fred, that Hans and Franz had uh, left the night before accompanied by Mayer's girlfriend, Thomas Marie. Uh, the Gestapo quickly tracked down Thomas Marie and threatened her with execution on the spot, barking, lead us to the radio operator or we, or you will be shot. Confronted directly by his girlfriend and top operative, Mayer looked her straight in the eye and, uh, according to legend, winked, and the Gestapo didn't catch on and she understood what to do, and she bravely led the officers on a wild goose chase, on a fruitless chase around the mountains for about five hours. Frustrated, believing Thomas Marie actually couldn't find Winberg, the Gestapo didn't make any arrests, they didn't kill her. Then that evening, in full defiance of the Gestapo, the village of, uh, that Winberg was hiding in did something truly extraordinary. Some sympathetic villagers went to the local church, prayed that Frederick Mayer would be delivered from the clutches of the Gestapo. There in the heart of the Third Reich, built around an ideology of racial hatred, Austrian villagers are praying for a Jewish spy. Pretty cool. Very little known historical moment. Meanwhile, Franz Weber and Hans Weinberg, they take, or Winberg, they take shelter at a nearby farmer's house. On April 24th, 1945, after three days in captivity, a man comes to Fred Mayer's cell wearing a military uniform now. Fred's in rough shape at this point, bearded and bearing the visible bruises of torture, wearing only an oversized tunic, pants without underwear, and shoes that don't fit. Mayer looks up and sees two Nazis. Uh, one of them takes Fred to the back of a BMW convertible and tells him who he is, Dr. Max Prims. 
Deputy de France Hofer, who again, as the Gauleiter, is essentially the governor who controlled the region's troops and defenses. Prims admits quietly that he and several other Germans admire Mayer for his courage during three days of torture. Uh, then he told Mayer that he was about to meet Franz Hofer at the mansion, at his mansion. How weird must that all feel? Mayer is headed to a meeting that never would have happened if it wouldn't have been for Mattel's brilliant lie, convincing the SS that Mayer was a powerful figure in the U.S. military. At the mansion, Mayer is introduced to Hofer, Hofer's wife, and the German ambassador to Benito Mussolini's government, a man named Rudolf Rahn. Some Axis powers bigwigs. On top of the large, fine wooden table in the main dining area is a cornucopia of fine food. Hofer offers Mayer a seat as the uh, kind of guest of honor. They sit down for a meal. Large bowl of soup, a glass of wine are placed in front of Mayer, who's starting to think that this is just another elaborate way of getting him to reveal the location of his radio operator. While the other guests begin to eat, Mayer doesn't make a move. Even after Hofer and Prims reassure him he still won't eat, finally Hofer comes over, puts his spoon into the bowl of broth and eats, assuring him that his bowl had not been poisoned. And then Mayer laughs and yells, Gutter fight! I poisoned my own soup with some tainted earwax I snuck in here, you fool! And then just like that, Hofer drops dead. Mayer jumps up, punches off Hofer's leg, uses it as a sword to decapitate uh, Prims and the other Axis assholes. Right? Just fucking goes bananas. I wish. No, uh, Mayer now eats some soup. And the men at the table began to discuss the war and eventually touched upon the possibility of Germany joining the Allies to fight the Russians. How weird is that that they thought that was a possibility? Look, I know we've been enemies, right? I know, you're not, I know the U.S. and the Allies aren't big fans of Nazis, but hear me out. What if we team up? Come on, think about it. We team up. We fuck up Russia. Come on, let's just try it. Uh, brazenly, Mayer asked how Germany could be trusted, how they think they could be trusted after they've broken all of their prior treaties. Uh, the table replies that the Russians were the only real enemy. Mayer begins to wonder, uh, are they actually talking about Germany surrendering? As the discussion continues, Ambassador Ron says he is going to burn and tells Mayer, I'm going back to Zurich and I plan on contacting your people and letting them know you're alive. These guys know the war, the war is almost over. And it sure is. They're now, uh, we're now six days from Hitler checking out. Once again, Mayer senses the trap, but he nods. He agrees to Ron's suggestion of contacting the OSS in Switzerland, since it's the only way to get a message to the OSS without revealing the location of his radio operator. Eventually, the conversation tapers off. The dinner comes to an end. As a parting gift, Hofer hands Mayer a sausage and a roll of bread, neither of which is much help considering he can't eat because of his fucked up teeth. He still suspects it's a trap, but it's not. Ron, was true to his word, delivers the message to the OSS office in Switzerland, headed up by future CIA director Alan Dulles. Dulles then cables OSS headquarters in Caserta, Italy. Fred Mayer reports he is in Gestapo hands, but cable, don't worry about me. I'm really not bad off. Meanwhile, Mayer is whisked back off to jail. Not quite out of the woods. On April 27th, the bellowing voice awakens Mayer in his jail cell. It's, it's a Gutner, that SS agent who had found Mayer, you know, and uh, uh, participated in torture and knocked out his teeth. This guy now dra drops a bag of cookies into Mayer's lap and remorsefully explains, I did not mean to torture you. I was just doing my job. Sorry about whipping your balls, bloody, and knocking out your teeth. Uh, you know, <laughs> job's a job. You know, you get it. It's following orders. Uh, what an interesting moment. Man, war can be so strange. I find it so funny that he gave him a bag of cookies. Like, I wonder if some part of him thought there was a chance of all being forgiven thanks to that. Like, Mayer, after the Allies free him, is going to be like, you know what? I want to hate you. You whipped my balls, bloody. You broke out so many of my teeth, I can't even eat a fucking sausage. But you also did give me a bag of cookies. And I, and I like cookies. So, uh, yeah, we're cool. All's forgiven. Uh, Gutner then explained that the entire jail in Innsbruck was being evacuated. The inmates were being moved to another location. Surrounded by armed guards, Mayer is marched now to the courtyard and then whisked away by car to the Reichenau concentration camp. Holy shit. The war is ending, but now there's a real good chance he's going to die. Before departing, Mayer gives the bag of cookies to the old guard who had treated him kindly. It's not like he could enjoy them. Reichenau was a concentration camp established in 1941 that held Jews from Northern Italy and members of the Austrian resistance, like so many concentration camps, basically all of them, a, send, a scene of daily atrocities. For fun, some SS guards in this camp once forced Jewish women to walk in a circle with sand cupped in their hands. If they noticed any of them dropping even a grain of sand, they uh, would open fire with their machine guns. And then, of course, they did. Just evil shit. Mayer found himself in the exact type of place his family had fled Germany to avoid ending up in. Thankfully, he would not be there for very long at all. Hours after his initial internment, old Dr. Max Prims boldly walks through the iron and barbed wire lace stockade that surrounded the camp, finds Mayer, and when questioned by SS guards, curtly replies, he's in my custody now. Prims took Mayer back to his office, which was next to Hofer's office. For the first time since he had been picked up by the Gestapo, Mayer is left alone while Prims dashes out of the office to take care of some business. He could have escaped, but Mayer reasoned that he was better off in Prim's hands than on his own. When he returns, Prim's explains to Mayer that Hofer is about to make a radio speech to the population of Innsbruck. 
and to thousands of SS soldiers defending the area. Hofer was preparing to bolster the defenses as well as implement plans for the werewolf movement, an underground insurgency to be led by fanatical SS men and Hitler youth who would continue the struggle and occupy Germany and Austria. He was going to exhort the population and the troops to make a last ditch stand, fight to the death for Germany. Primus thought this was madness. Go talk some sense into him. Make him declare Innsbruck an open city, he told Mayor. Mayor then went into Hofer's office, who was busy writing a speech. Mayor told Hofer that if the Germans decided to make a last stand, America was essentially going to fuck them up. Their air power and artillery would flatten Innsbruck. Did Hofer not have any regard for the lives of Innsbruck's civilians? Mayor continued, once armored troops break through the mountain passes, Innsbruck will be destroyed. It is insane to order a last-ditch effort. If you love Innsbruck and its people, why destroy it? You haven't got a chance. Hofer looked conflicted. I need fair treatment, he said, referring to conditions of his surrender. Mayor jumped on the opening. I will make you and your staff my prisoners and guarantee your lives, Mayor told him. You're right, Hofer sheepishly responded. He wasn't going to make the call now. Mayor did it. He bluffed this Nazi governor essentially into standing down. Mayor recalled 63 years later, I had no authority to take anyone prisoner or guarantee their safety. I just thought it was a good idea. Solid bluff. With Mayor in the room, the Gauleiter got on the radio, made the announcement that Innsbruck was an open city and that forces should lay down their weapons and surrender. Thousands of SS and regular army troops garrisoned in Innsbruck could have slowed the Allied advance and caused hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths on both sides had he not relayed this order. The dream of a last stand at the Alpine Redoubt had now really, truly, officially died. Mayor's plan to take over Innsbruck has become a reality. Once the message had been made, Fred Mayer goes to find Winberg who could be critical or who would be critical to get messages back to the allies that the city of Innsbruck is ready to surrender and that there would be no last stand, no Alpine fortress. Hail Nimrod. He finds Winberg at the farmhouse uh, where he was hidden. And in a BMW, they drive back to Hofer's mansion. They make their way to the foyer where Winberg is now treated to dinner with the Hofers. How very strange. Hofer will later be sentenced to death for war crimes. Dude was a tried and true Nazi, cool with the eradication of the Jewish race. Now he's having a nice meal with two Jewish Americans as World War II winds down to an end. At dinner, Dr. Prims discusses allowing Mayer to fly his aeroplane, which sat in a hangar at a nearby field. I know usually you say airplane, but it was written in the source as aeroplane. I was like, that's pretty cute. Mayer wisely said uh, no, considering the heavy presence of Allied fighters. Winberg later recalled the scene. There was high tension. I had trouble putting the spoon to my lips without shaking. I was 21 years old in front of some of the most powerful Nazis of the Third Reich. Also present at the dinner, dinner table was Major Alfred von Frauenfeld, former Gauleiter of Vienna, he discussed his post-war plans to write a historical treatise about the fall of the Nazis. All at the table agreed that Mayer somehow needed to get to, uh, through to the American lines to relay Hofer's message of the pending surrender of Innsbruck. Hofer was the first to retire that night while the rest of the party stayed up until dawn, debating and arguing the course of the war. The Germans asked these guys, why did America have to mix herself up in a completely European affair? And the Americans' answer was that the word of Hitler meant nothing and that no country was safe from Nazi aggression. And I imagine the Germans then saying something along the lines of, well... Yeah, no, nah, yeah, that's no, nah, that's fair. That tracks. That night, the Nazis also hinted at the coming of the Cold War, citing numerous examples of friction between the Russians and Western powers. They kept on warning us of the menace of Russian domination of Europe, recalled Winberg later. Early afternoon the next day, April 28th, two days before Hitler's death, Hofer approaches the two Jewish spies, says bluntly he's surrendering unconditionally. With Hofer having fulfilled his end of the bargain, Mayer assumes command, places Winberg in charge of the 15-man police guard and some other Nazis, including Hofer, uh, and they put him under house arrest. My, how the tables have turned. Three dudes, two of them young American Jews, parachuting behind enemy lines. A couple of months later, they have high-ranking Nazis taking their commands under house arrest. They have to feel pretty damn good about themselves right now. Mayor now sets out toward the American lines to relay news of the surrender officially. Still injured from his days of torture, but victorious, Fred Mayer felt the wind hit his face as he drove down the road toward the American lines to the west. After about 20 minutes, he noticed an American outpost and an MP standing guard. An officer arrived and used a field phone to call the 103rd Division headquarters. Major Bland West from Norman, Oklahoma, arrived on the scene and then accompanied Fred Mayer back to Hofer's office. There they had talks with Hofer, who officially surrendered to the uh, major and was promised fair treatment. Meanwhile, Hofer had a long talk with Fred and Hans, who convinced him to make an additional radio speech telling the people and the SS and Army garrison surrounding Innsbruck that the war was absolutely lost. Do not participate in werewolf activities. Cooperate with the Americans. Oh, and uh, Hitler now dies. That also happens. More on that in a second. By May 4th, the 103rd was occupying Innsbruck, and Mayer and Winberg are congratulated. Franz Weber also now comes out of hiding. The Green Up Power Trio team is reunited. Meanwhile, Hofer is placed under house arrest, which disappoints Mayer, who had promised him that he'd be treated fairly. He demands and receives from Major Bland West a letter promising Hofer would be treated fairly, 
But then while under house arrest, Hofer pulls off a remarkable escape. He flees to Germany, where he will uh, get back to work in his trade as a salesman like he did before the war, unrecognized, and eventually using his true name, he lives free and dies in 1975 uh, of, you know, he lives a long life. He was tried in absentia for his war crimes by the People's Court of Innsbruck in 1949 and was given a death sentence, but obviously that was never carried out. Shortly after midnight on May 7th, 1945, the Nazis surrender. With both fronts collapsing and defeat inevitable, Hitler had committed suicide in his bunker deep below the Reich Chancellery on April 30th, 1945. His successor was Admiral Karl Donitz, but he saw the writing on the wall and surrendered. As the news of Germany's surrender reaches the rest of the world, joyous crowds gather to celebrate in the streets, clutching newspapers that declared victory in Europe, VE Day. With Germany's official surrender, life slowly begins to return to normal in Innsbruck. The local paper returns to the press, or returns, you know, to press, to start printing papers again. Businesses gradually reopen. Hans and Franz attempt to get their first good night of sleep in months. American troops are now busy quickly hunting down the area's Nazi offic- Nazis, the area's Nazi officials, including Walter Gutner, the SS agent who'd given Mayor the cookies. After busting his teeth out and whipping his balls bloody, they apprehended him and asked Fred Mayer if he wanted to see him. Mayer briskly walked to the very halls of the Gestapo jail that had once housed him. He made his way through the dank corridors to the cell that held his nemesis. Trembling, Gutner stammered to Mayer, do anything you want to me, but don't hurt my family. Mayer looked Gutner directly in the eye and responded, who do you think we are? Nazis? Nice! And then when Gutner let his guard down, he yelled, cut or fight! Pulled out a bag of stale, rock-hard cookies and beat him to death with them. No, of course not. What he did was turn his back on Walter Gutner for the last time. Not sure what happened to Walter when it came to war crimes punishment. Uh, not a big enough Nazi to rank much uh, being written about him, I guess. On May 17th, Hans and uh, Mayer, they say goodbye to their friends in Innsbruck and prepare to head out. Fred embraced Thomas Marie one last time. She's staying. He's heading back to America. Right? They're breaking up, but on good terms, I guess. Mayer and Winberg, they shake hands with Franz Weber. A few days later, Weber and his fiance travel back to the glacier. I, lo- I love this detail. They, they travel back to the glacier where they all dropped in behind enemy lines. They locate the white silk from Operation Greenup's parachute canopies, and then she will use that fabric to make her wedding dress. That's fucking cool. Hail, Lucifina. Before departing Innsbruck, uh, Hans taps out a final Morse code message. Gadsden to base, closed my circuit net, t- uh, taking over this morning. Many thanks to three months cooperation. Best regards from Fred and Hans. And of course, Fred Mayer and Hans Winbrook. Uh, Winberg, there we go. Uh, do also, uh, they now they travel to Salzburg, Austria, where the OSS had established a new headquarters and where they are reunited with other Jewish OSS recruits. Meanwhile, as American troops are liberating concentration camps, the men learn of their own family's fates. Winberg learns that his mom, dad, sister, and little brother have been killed at Auschwitz. And that, of course, is so tragic. After his epic victory, after saving so many lives, the worst possible news. The war now over, the men now head back to America to live the lives of ordinary civilians. They've been sworn to secrecy which meant that they didn't receive any recognition upon returning home. So what happened to them? What happened to some of the other characters involved in Operation Greenup? Thomas Marie was happily married after the war. Uh, so she's fine. She found another guy, another fella. Uh, she's also awarded the Austrian Liberation Medal for her heroic sacrifices during the war. Dino Lowenstein became the owner of a small graphics business, wrote several books on graphic te- uh, graphing techniques. Uh, Herman Mattel got his last payment for his duties, was never heard of again or from again after 1945. That was the guy with the messed up hand who saved... Uh, Mayor's life with his you know bullshit story about him being a bigwig. After retiring from the military as a captain, John Billings, that pilot, becomes a commercial pilot. This is this is a really cool footnote. At age 96 in 2019, he was still piloting a Cessna Cutlass. Uh, most of the time, he was flying angel flights, transporting people in need of medical attention. He just stopped flying. He's still alive and healthy. An article just came out about him a month ago. He's alive and well in, a fa- in Falls Church, Virginia. He just wrote a book. Finished writing it, uh, Special Duties Pilot, The Man Who Flew the Real and Glorious Bastards Behind Enemy Lines. You can pre-order it right now. Comes out on August 31st. Love it. Hail Nimrod. Dr. Max Prim spent several months behind bars following the end of the war and then returned to a successful plastic surgery practice. After the war, Mayer became friends with Prims, visited him several times while working in Europe over the years. Uh, Hans Winberg built himself a very distinguished career. He received a PhD in chemistry. Remember him reading those chemistry books? Uh, from the University of Wisconsin, taught at the University of Minnesota and Tulane University, eventually returned to the Netherlands to chair the chemistry department at the University of Groningen. He authored hundreds of papers, supervised a group of PhD students who became leaders in their fields, started Syncom, a company specializing in organic synthesis, and then he died in the Netherlands May 25th, 2011, at the age of 88. Fred Mayer, 
He was discharged from the OSS in 1945, received the Purple Heart and the Legion of Merit. After the war, he worked at General Motors, later worked for Voice of America as a supervisor, traveled the world. In uh, 1990, the Austrian government awarded him the Tyrolean Order of the Eagle in gold. He died on April 15th, 2014 in Charlestown, West Virginia at the age of 94. He had volunteered for Meals on Wheels in Charlestown for more than three decades. And he was delivering meals in the area just a few weeks before his death. He's, uh, he was survived by two daughters and a longtime partner, Virginia Nash. In an interview at his home two months before his death, he said he never really liked being called a hero, but he sure was, wasn't he? His former OSS pilot Billings interviewed shortly after his death said, I was in awe of him. He was born without the fear gene. He feared nothing, and he was able to be whatever he needed to be. Of course he feared nothing. He was a motherfucking gutter fighter of the first degree. Hail Nimrod, you real and glorious bastard. Let's get out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Operation Green Up. Such a crazy story. Such a good, such an awesome story. I hope you liked it as much as I did. Hope my mush mouth didn't, uh, didn't ruin it for you because it's a fantastic story. It all began when Fred Mayer, an immigrant who had initially been denied entry to the U.S. Army, enlisted again, is let in, then based on how well he did in training, his supervisors determined he'd be a good candidate to join the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA. Shortly thereafter, he meets Hans Winberg, who would become Operation Greenup's radio operator, the duo then joined by Franz Weber in Italy, former Nazi, current POW, who decided to become a, you know, a spy to help them and the real life and glorious bastards are born. After months of training and waiting around, including learning how to parachute from planes, they finally get their mission to investigate the area known as the Alpine Redoubt, the place where it was thought that Hitler would try to lead the Third Reich when Berlin fell. Uh, Germany's propaganda campaign about the Alpine Redoubt had been so effective that no one really knew what was going on there, impeding the Allies' ability to successfully launch the final military campaigns to close out World War II. Operation Greenup would get that info and so much more. Eventually, it would liberate the city of Innsbruck, not before Fred Mayer pretended to be a French electrician, uh, got discovered by the Gestapo, was subjected to some horrific torture, some ball whipping, even placed briefly in an Aust Austrian concentration camp. A combination of bravery and extreme luck saved him. Another OSS operative, Herman Mattel, told the Gestapo that Fred Mayer was a high-ranking American official and there would be serious consequences for his captors if he was killed. A lot of bravery, a lot of quick thinking in this tale. Fred Mayer especially, what a legendary dude. Fred, Hans, Franz, right? They wouldn't have been able to do what they did without the cooperation of so many other people living in Nazi-occupied territory who were not fans of Hitler. People risking their, uh, being labeled traitors, risking their lives, risking being executed or sent to concentration camps for helping the OSS agents. Some of them, like Thomas Marie, directly assisted operations. Others at great risk to themselves housed the spies. Some were their friends and cared for them, even prayed for them. Some were strangers who just believed in what they were doing. Interesting to me that even senior Nazi officials who had conversations with Fred and Hans to facilitate Innsbruck's surrender treated them with respect and dignity and clearly liked them. There were clearly some very, very special meat sacks. I'm glad we got to hear their story. Let's look at their amazing story a few more times in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Fred Mayer, Hans Winberg, and Franz Hofer went behind enemy lines by parachuting into Naki, into Naki? They, they parachuted into Naki, the Naki Taki land. They parachuted into Nazi-occupied Austria and traveled on foot for days before reaching the town of Innsbruck, where Fred would sneak into a factory, talk with some rail yard officials, enter a German soldier's clubhouse to get imp important information for the OSS. Also traveled by rail, also traveled by sled at up to 60 miles an hour. Insanity. Operation Greenup was just uh, number two, excuse me. Operation Greenup was just one of the OSS's missions, uh, many missions, the wartime intelligence agency that was the forerunner to the CIA. Number three, Fred Mayer was tortured for days, his genitals whipped, his teeth broken, waterboarded, left in a freezing cell, and none of that broke him. Then when he had a chance to get some revenge on the Nazi that tortured him, did not stoop to his level. Honorable man. Number four, also called the Alpine Fortress, the Alpine Redoubt. Uh, was a redoubt, meaning an area that a country can retreat into following a defeat in combat, planned by Heinrich Himmler in November uh, and December of 1943 for Germany's government and armed forces. It was also a big lie uh, that Operation Greenup uncovered. The Nazis would make no heavily fortified, well-armed last stand. It was just a plan they made for propaganda. Number five, new info. We mentioned some of the other people who were involved in OSS operations, some of them Hollywood actors and actresses like Marlena Dietrich, in 1920s Berlin, Marlene had won fame for her acting in German silent movies. Her performance in Lola Lola in the 1930, or as Lola Lola, 
In the 1930 movie, The Blue Angel brought her international acclaim in a contract with Paramount Pictures. She would appear in dozens of movies. She was also a spy who vehemently opposed Hitler. In 1937, Dietrich, who was then a German citizen, was approached by Nazi representatives, asked to star in some propaganda films for the Third Reich. Adolf Hitler himself allegedly personally requested she support this cause. Dietrich, who was staunchly anti-Nazi, refused. Two years later, she renounced her German citizenship, applied for U.S. citizenship, and the Nazis branded her a traitor. In British wartime radio broadcasts and over German airwaves, Dietrich spoke directly to her former countrymen, saying Hitler is an idiot. Hail Marlena! Dietrich also worked with the OSS to record a series of anti-Nazi albums, using propaganda to weaken the morale of Nazi troops. The broadcast of these songs and interviews were meant to create tension between the Axis powers, and it worked. The U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey discovered that the programs were just as devastating to German morale as an air raid. As the broadcast continued, more and more Germans and Italians began to doubt Nazi and fascist propaganda. Pretty cool how you can make such a big difference during a war without ever picking up a weapon. Uh, if she did that kind of social activism today, how many fans would be bitching about how she just stick to her singing, just stick to making movies, we don't want to hear your political bullshit? I'm sure uh, she had a lot of people back, a lot of people back then saying the same thing. But she didn't listen to them, thank God, and she helped the Allies defeat her home country. She was a lot more than an internationally famous sex symbol. She was a social justice warrior in the best possible way. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Operation Green Up has been sucked. Hope you enjoyed that gutter fight. I love saying that. Gutter fight. <laughs> Such a fun term. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making time suck. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley. Sophie, the fact sorceress Evans. Run a point on this week's research. Bit Elixir for continuously refining the time suck app. Logan, the art warlock. Keith, running badmagicmerch.com, working on our socials along with Liz Hernandez, being the visual artist for all things bad magic. Thanks to all those who joined the new Cult of the Curious private Facebook group, Cult of the Curious 2, or one of the many online subgroups out there. Uh, thank you to Liz Hernandez and our all-seeing eyes running our Cult of the Curious Facebook page and to Beefsteak and the Mod Squad for running Discord. Next week on Time Suck, we go full cult, cult, cult. Very excited to learn about Dwight York and the Nawabia Nation of Moors. Once a simple suburban kid from New Jersey, Dwight York, a.k.a. Malachi York, a.k.a. Dr. Love, a.k.a. a whole bunch of other bullshit names, I would rise to power as a cult leader, adding more chaos to an already chaotic time and place, New York City in the 70s. York led a group in Brooklyn in the 1970s called the Ansaru Allah Community, or the AAC, and that's where he got his first taste of what it felt like to be a cult leader. He would then change locations and names, eventually setting on the Nawabian Nation of Moors. Called by the Southern Poverty Law Center, a black supremacist cult, the Nawabians under Dwight York taught that Adam and Eve, or Hawa, were Nubian. And the white people were devils, which according to Dwight York was evident in the word Caucasian. Hello? Carcass Asian is what it almost kind of looks like, which could mean denigrated Asian. So, you know, that's how you think when you don't understand how words are formed. Uh, dude taught a lot of crazy shit. Whenever he needed something new to keep his followers in line, he distracted them with, by giving them something crazy to focus on, like... Uh, when all of a sudden he tells them that they're really uh, Egyptian UFO believers. It took some weird twists as this cult progressed. Finally, in the early 2000s, the law caught up with him. When it did, York was living on a massive Egyptian theme park-like compound called Tamore in Georgia with a couple hundred followers. Yep. Among those followers, a lot of kids, sadly. Uh, children Dwight York were abusing. Uh, of course he was. He'd eventually be charged with hundreds of counts of abuse. So many that the prosecution had to knock off some of the charges because they thought the jury would find it too unbelievable that one person could do all that, but he did. So much crazy coming next week here on Time Suck. I can't wait. And now time for this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Now let's start off with some comedy. Our first update this week comes from Cummins Law victim and funny sack, Paul Albano. Paul writes, hey, pecker. <laughs> I love this word. Hey, peckerhead. <laughs> Permission to swear. 250 some odd episodes in Cummins Law finally and epically rams me hard. Fair amount of se setup here. Did I use that correctly? Never know when you use a semicolon. Well, I think you did. My son's daycare is near my office, so I picked him up to bring him to his pediatrician's office for an appointment. My wife met me there. I pulled in, shut off the truck, started to get out when she waved me down walking from her Jeep. Pandemic and all, they're still not allowing people to stay in the waiting room, so you have to wait in your vehicle and they call you. She, de she decided to come sit in my truck since the baby was in there. She got in, I started the truck back up to get the AC blowing. And what can only be considered divine interve in intervention, the Bluetooth kicked on, started playing the HP Lovecraft suck at the exact moment the pediatrician's office called her phone to tell us to come in. She answered her phone on speaker, just as you said, you gotta be careful what you jerk off to. 
It's hard to define the roller coaster of emotions in, the, in that moment as I tried to decipher the pregnant pause on the other end of the phone and the simultaneous look of utter embarrassment, shock, and awe from my wife. You know, on one hand, well done, cummy boy, well done. But on the other hand, now I have to navigate explaining to my wife what exactly I was listening to and make eye contact with the poor front desk attendant in the pediatrician's office. All in all, three out of five stars would get Cummins lot again. Keep up the good work, Paul. Love it, Paul. Oh my God. I, I never get tired of hearing those messages about just the most uncomfortable situations. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know what? I, I, I guess you don't have to see them that long when you interact uh, with the, uh, the, the front desk attendant. And you know, there's a huge uh, labor shortage. There's people just leaving jobs all the time right now to go to other things. You know, maybe she'll, I don't know, bounce off to somewhere else pretty soon. Uh, best of luck. Now, a quick and funny pronunciation update coming in from furious sucker, Nathan Fessler. Nathan writes, dear suck master or dear suck master flex. I'm not good at pronouncing things. So I am sympathetic to your mush mouth, but this one's out of hand. <laughs> I love these as well. So how fired up people get. I've heard you mess it up every time it comes up, and I don't know how it hasn't been pointed out. Any town that ends in Shire in the UK or US is not pronounced Shire like some motherfucking hobbits. <laughs> I know it's spelled the same, but it's pronounced sure. You know, like the fucking state, New Hampshire. Anyways, that was bothering me. <laughs> I just never understand why people in the US think the syllable changes when you go to the UK. Your loyal time sucker, Nate. I love it, Nate. Thank you. I don't understand either. Fucking English, you know, it's complicated. I didn't even realize I was doing that. Yeah, New Hampshire. That's a great point of comp comparison because it is spelled like New Hampshire. And the Hobbit reference, that killed me. Uh, now another update coming from the UK about all kinds of things. From sweet sucker Mark Burroughs. Mark writes, Sir Dan Dan, the suck master man, lord of all who sucketh. Greetings from uh, Worcester, England, not too far from the west city of Gloucester. Uh, hopefully I said it. I don't know if it's Wor Worcester or Worcester. My Worcester. Sorry in advance for the long message. But probably Worcester. Uh, I'd like to start by saying how great this week's suck was. You did us Brits proud apart from one reoccurring pronunciation, Shire. All right. And then this is interesting to me. Uh, now, Mark writes it as Sheer, S-H-E-E-R. -E so like Sheer instead of Sure. So uh, I found out so much more than I'd previously known. Uh, I've been listening to Time Suck for almost a year now. Love it. I've been uh, working my way through the episodes. Being a postman means I get my headphones on and get at least one and a half episodes a day in my lug holes. This week has been an ear bashing like no other. I love this. This week so far, I've listened to The Toy Box Killer, Penhurst Hospital, Albert Fish, Showbiz, The 100 Drunk as Fuck Special, and this week's fantastic British installment, which left me a bit red-faced. little Cummins Law in here. While listening to the episode, a group of elderly ladies were out for their weekly walk. We always stop for a quick chat. So I pause the episode. Suddenly, mid-sentence, an advert for Whipple starts blasting out of my phone. As I frantically try to unlock my phone to hit pause, the lady stands straight face. The ad ends, and I manage to hit pause. Whilst most of the women look gobsmacked, gobsmacked one little old lady says, they won't sell many of them with all that swearing. <laughs> I hope that she walked away from that thinking that was a real product. She's like, well, good luck uh, getting people to buy your energy drink when you call them pieces of shit and tell them to, you know, go fuck themselves and uh, suck their mom's dick, whatever it is. Uh, I could have told them it was a podcast, but explaining what a podcast was would have taken too long. So thank you, you beautiful bastard. On the episode in which you sucked yourself, you gave no top five takeaways. Guys, it's been so long, I forgot it. I'd like to add some if you don't mind. We were all little shits when we were young. Number one, we were all little shits when we were young. But take those experiences and make yourself better. Number two, if you want something enough, work hard, believe in yourself, and reach your goals. Number three, humor is fantastic. If you don't have any, get some meat sacks. Number four, stay inquisitive. Keep asking questions. Use your knowledge for good. And number five, keep fucking sucking. Well, that was nice. I could go on all day, but I'll cut it short. One last thing. My kids love the Piney song. I have the original as the ringtone, as my ringtone. Oh, that's awesome. They're not sure what a butt baby, <laughs> butt baby is, but uh, they don't ask, luckily. They even made up a version for when our Lasso Opso pup, Joy, eats our leftover curry and has an orange beard. Adorable. Could you please give a shout out to my wife, Amy, who I always update with recent episodes. She was nearly sick when I told her about Jupiter's Twist and the Spanish Inquisition app. <laughs> my kids, Louis, Ruby, and little Timmy. And uh, please give them a special piney hoedown. Take care, all you Time Suck listeners. Thank you to Dan, your family, and the whole time, a team for a great podcast. Hail Nimrod, Praise the Jingles, Triple M, and Curse You, Lucifina, sometimes. Kindest regards, Mark Burroughs. Oh, that was very, very nice, Mark. Uh, thank you. What a thoughtful message. Glad I got most of my UK pronunciations correct. Uh, thank you, Amy, for listening. And uh, Louis, Ruby, and little Timmy, look at here now. You got a good dad, goodest dad that you ever did had. Be glad he's not Fred West. Yikes. Thank you again, Mark. Now an entertaining message related to the P.T. Barnum suck from funny sucker Ashley Rawls. Ashley writes, Hey, Dan and the team, I was listening to the P.T. Barnum suck this morning where you talk about tellers of tall tales. 
And I thought you might like to hear my experience with the banquet chef at the venue I work at. I love hearing about these kind of people. On the surface, he seems like a normal guy. But wouldn't you know it, uh, he was in the CIA and in the FBI. He's constantly running out to luncheons to meet with them because they so desperately want him back on duty. Apparently, he left to be with his true love, Sports Illustrated model, <laughs> Christy Brinkley. But then had to break off their engagement because she was de- uh, demanding a foursome with her, quote, sexy model lady friends to which he was morally opposed to. Heartbreaking. Don't you hate it when that happens? Mind you, this guy is around 60 years old, lives with his parents, and has the biggest <laughs> has the biggest beer belly in Wisconsin. You're just painting such a visual. But that, hasn't stopped, but that hasn't stopped him from being a red belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's nearly impossible to accomplish. Check the wiki page. <laughs> And he was the personal bodyguard to none other than heavyweight boxer Mike Tyson, to whom he is a great personal friend and is still his in case <laughs> in case of emergency contact. I love it when they just don't know how to fucking scale it back. Uh, incredible. I hope you get a little laugh out of that. Well, clearly I did. Thanks for all you do. I recommend you to everyone. That's so nice. Keep on sucking. Keep your tails tall, but believable. Ashley Rawl. God. Lucky you, Ashley, to get to work with such a natural born storyteller. Ah, he'd be so bored by today's story. Just pff, pff. Mayor and Wimberg didn't even date one supermodel in that story. <laughs> didn't have a single foursome that <laughs> they spoke of, you know. Okay. Uh, I think when he starts telling you that shit, you should just start saying like, what? Me too. Just like always me too. It. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, me too. Holy shit. And obviously not the hashtag me too. I just thought of that after I said it, clearly. Uh, weird coincidence there. But yeah, but if you're like, oh yeah, same. Same Z's. <laughs> oh, you dated Chrissy Brinkley? Get the fuck! I dated Chrissy Brinkley. You're being recruited by the CIA and the FBI to. Re- oh my god, me too. You are friends with Mike Tyson. We should all hang out because I'm like one of his best friends too. Uh, now for more comedy. Another Cummins Law victim. Poor sucker Thomas Larson writes, "You son of Lucifina, you got me with the Cummins Law moment." I thought I was immune to that, but it turns out where there is Whipple, there is a way. <laughs> I recently moved to a different state, and even got the chance to meet you in person at the Suck Dungeon. I was a big ass uh, Ed Kemper looking dude that probably smelled like road trip swamp ass. Sorry about that. <laughs> you didn't. And at my new job, they were pretty relaxed about using earbuds to listen to music. Well, I was listening to your HP Lovecraft suck. I heard my battery low warning, but was busy. Um, but was busy with my hands, thinking it would just pause the episode. It did. But then Nimrod had other plans. My phone must have turned the screen on, and I pocket played the episode just in time to hear from my pocket. Stop sucking your mama's dick, you basement dwelling mouth breather, <laughs> at full volume. Needless to say, I got some odd looks from my brand new coworkers. Luckily, after a quick explanation, we all laughed it off. Love the podcast. Listen to them all. Making me a bad magician. Keep up the suck. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. Well, thank you, Thomas. I do remember you stopping by. I do not remember you smelling. All good. Glad you work with some cool coworkers uh, to handle that one because uh, they could have easily not handled your explanation. Hope you're well. And finally, an advice request from turning this shit around Whipple drinker, Nicholas Archdeke. Archdecky? Nicholas, I have no fucking idea how to say your name. Nicholas writes, Hello, Master Sucker and Bad Magic Crew. I write to you today seeking the guidance of our glorious Lord Nimrod. I've suffered from very strong depression and cut myself off from most everyone. I've taken solace in food and all things fatty, but no more. Listening to your podcast and your openness about mental health issues, I decided it's time to kick this in the butt. So I'd like to ask your wisdom. What's the best way to shed these pounds and attempt to rebuild relationships with not only others, but with myself? Thanks for all that you've done. You've kept me from uh, some awful things, guided me from a very dark place, and I'm forever in your debt. You guided me back from a very grateful space that keep on sucking. Well, what a nice message, Nicholas. Uh, so happy to hear that you're making some positive changes. Um, I'm uh, clearly not a counselor or a trainer, obviously as well. I think there's going to be a lot of advice out there. I think the key with both uh, rebuilding relationships and with rebuilding your body is patience. Uh, don't look for immediate results. You want results too fast. It, it's easy to have that turn into disappointment and then into giving up. Focus on small victories. Understand not every relationship is meant to be rebuilt. Not every body is going to look like it should be on the cover of a muscle and fitness magazine. And that's okay. Pick a healthy eating plan activity that's right for you. There's so many out there. Talk to an expert. You know, do some digging. Find the, find the one that you think uh, could work. Because everybody's going to tell you like, oh, you got to do this. Oh, you got to do this. No, you don't. Uh, there's a lot that can work. Find the one that resonates with you. The one, uh, you know, there's definitely not a one way. And maybe... And this, you know, people can tell you different things. I say throw away the scale. I'm not a big uh, fan of uh, scales, truly. Just focus on how you feel and how your clothes fit. And I say that as somebody who is definitely not in the best shape of my life right now, but I'm fine with that. I'm fine with where I'm at right now. And, uh, you know, when I get more time down the road, fine. Maybe I'll get in better shape or maybe I'll fucking keep having more cocktails tonight. Um, 
but celebrate small victories. You can only speed walk, you know, uh, for two minutes, maybe at first. And all of a sudden you can do it for five, you know, feel good about that. Don't wait until you can run a fucking marathon or run a mile, whatever. And, and just know that every journey has setbacks. It is part of the process. Truly. Some days you're going to move backwards and that is okay. Right? Play the long game. Too many people want that magic bullet. Right? And that it just doesn't fucking work in, in, in the long run. And, and lean in, lean in to enjoy, uh, you know, enjoying small victories. I hope that somewhat generic advice helps and ask a lot of people. You're going to get a lot of different advice, uh, reasonable goals. That's what I think I'm, I'm all about reasonable goals. Rome wasn't built in a day and you don't have to transform your whole fucking life in a day either. And also, you know, I know it sounds cheesy, but love yourself, get yourself some slack and hail Nimrod, you beautiful bastard. That's all for today's time sucker updates. Thanks time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic production podcast, Meat Sex. Please uh, don't get any fights this week. You never know when you're going to go head to head with the gutter fighter. They're around and they're dangerous. Keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Little troll doll. Oh, little troll doll. No, no, I'm a fucking knife.